everybody and welcome to the 16th meeting of the Citizen Participation and Public Petitions Committee in 2024. We are in a different committee room from our normal one this morning because one of our witnesses is joining us online and uh, so sorry I've been nodding in the wrong direction to the uh, sound people to tell us to go live because they're sitting in a different part of the room this morning. Um, our colleague Fergus Ewing unfortunately is not able to join the committee this morning so we have apologies from Fergus. Um, the first item on the agenda, therefore, and we don't have a substitute uh, from uh, Fergus from uh, from the SNP or from Fergus for that uh, for this morning's business. Uh, our first item is simply to agree to take uh, business in private on item five uh, and uh, and agenda item four. Uh, agenda item four will be considering the evidence we've heard this morning, and agenda item five will be we when we consider the final draft report on our inquiry into the A9. Uh, are colleagues content to take that item? Probably are. Thank you. That brings us to agenda item two, which is consideration of continuing petitions. And the first of those petitions is petition number PE 2089 to stop more national parks in Scotland. And this has been lodged by Deborah Carmichael on behalf of the Lochaber National Park No More Group. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to suspend any action to create further national parks in Scotland, to instruct an independent review on the operation of the current national parks, including assessment of the economic impacts on businesses and industries within the two parks, including but not exclusive to farming, forestry, crofting and angling to conduct a consultation with representatives of rural businesses and community councils in order to help to frame the remit of said independent review. Now, I'm delighted we are joined this morning uh, over two panels. And in this first panel, we have Denise Brownlee from the No Galloway National Park Campaign Group, by Mary Dawson from the National Farmers Union of Scotland, by Nick Kemp, who's joining us online uh, from Parks Watch Scotland, and Ian McKinnon, the Lochaber National Park No More campaign. So a very warm welcome to all of you. I don't know if you've presented to a committee of the Scottish Parliament before, um, but we'll try to make it as enjoyable and, uh, and discursive and revealing an exercise uh, for you as possible. Uh, we're obviously very keen to hear what you have to say in order that it can fully inform our consideration of the aims of the petition. Now, we previously considered this petition uh, at our meeting on the 12th of June, and at that time we agreed to write to the Scottish Government. And since that meeting, the Scottish Government has responded, stating that there are no current plans for the Scottish Government to conduct an independent review of the two existing national parks in Scotland, as national parks are accountable to their boards and to the Scottish Government. They have also outlined in their national park proposal that there will be opportunities for local consultation during the next phase in the process as Nature Scott carries out its duties as the reporter. So, um, if witnesses are content, we've actually got quite a lot of stuff we'd like to explore with you, so we'll move straight to questions. Um, I don't know how we will decide who's going to uh, indicate that they're going to take the lead, but if you want to just give me a nod to say that you'd like to speak, and Mr. Kemp, I think if you wave a hand or something, um, we'll, we'll, I can see you, so we'll know that you are, uh, you are interested in contributing to, to the particular questions. So let me start off. Um, looking at the various aims of the petition, and that is what we come back to, um, what evidence do you feel there is that is available currently on the environmental and socio-economic impacts of our existing national parks? And do you feel that the evidence that is available, such as you might believe it to be, is enough to adequately assess what the impact has been, such that that evidence and that impact is able to inform future decisions, including future designations? And I imagine that is at the heart of, well, at, almost at the heart of the consideration of the petition that we don't know enough and that's why an inquiry needs to be held. But uh, Mr McKinnon, you're quite happy to... Yes, thanks very, <clears throat> uh, thanks very much for seeing this. 
Uh, I'm Ian McKinnon, I'm a fisherman and a mussel farmer up on the west coast of Scotland. Y you mentioned nature, Scott, and uh, you know where do we stand? We spoke to Lorna Slater when she was uh, the minister responsible for nature, Scott, and she highlighted that this proposal for a third national park uh, was very much driven by the need to uh, address the biodiversity crisis and the climate change crisis. I have here a statement from Nature Scott's own biodiversity statistics. Um, if I can read them to you, uh, I'll find them first, hopefully. Um, but basically, they're saying trends in abundance for 337 species have m remained remarkably stable since uh, since, two uh, since 19... Uh, let me find this, please. I'm, I'm getting a bit... Until 2023, when these figures go up to... Um, from, I think, 1997, whenever they, they, they first took, uh, started monitoring the biodiversity. Biodiversity in numbers has remained remarkably stable. And this is Nature Scott's own figures. You can find them on their website. Uh, in terms of biodiversity occupancy, which is the spread of uh, different species, they're saying that that has increased by 24%. When it comes to marine biodiversity, Nature Scott claims that uh, the marine biodiversity has declined by 41%, but they're only basing that on 11 species of seabird. Whenever you look at the underlying figures, it shows that in some cases, uh, cephalopods have increased by 390%. The other four groups that they've looked at have increased by a minimum of 90%. Uh, but they discard that in favour of projecting a negative based on uh, 11 species of seabird. And this has been through a period that we know <coughs> we've suffered from avian flu. Um, so I, I think the idea that uh, it's nature, Scott, that plays such an important part in the designation. Their own figures are showing that the biodiversity crisis, they're not supporting it in the, their own statements of statistics that they're making. Um, OK, so actually, I think what you are concluding from that is that you feel that the evidence base is subjective rather than objective and is, for want of a better description of it, cherry-picking where it's looking to find its evidence rather than drawing that evidence out from the broadest possible base. I would say that, yes. I would also question whether Nature Scott, who would appear to have supported a number of the groups who put in the initial applications, um, and, and then assess those applications and are now acting as reporters to the government if they can truly be considered an impartial and unbiased uh, organisation on this. I think somebody highlighted at the last meeting that it was like somebody setting their own homework and marking it. That sounds very much... Like our colleague Fergus Ewing. Yeah. <laughs> I would also highlight that uh, the other crisis that, that, that uh, Ms Slater, uh, the climate change crisis, I think there is some evidence coming to light now that uh, national park authorities have funded actions that are questionable at best, okay. uh, involving considerable sums of money, uh, they're an ongoing process, but there's no evidence to suggest that the designation of a national park really does anything. 
to, to solve that. Okay, well, 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 let's move along. Does anybody want to comment particularly on that? Yes. Uh, yes, okay, um, Mary Dawson. And so, I'm going to come to you next, actually, after okay, that, with right. the next question. Um, so, NFU Scotland uh, enjoy a very good working relationship with Nature Scotland, and that's one we will continue and maintain outside the process of national parks, but within it as well. However, we are very grateful. They have promised to be open and transparent, and so far they have been, but we share the concerns that they have intimated. They are not uh, neutral. They are proponents of a national park. The messaging that we are getting in Galloway is all about new national park. It's not proposed national park. The questions are, what do you want your new national park to look like, not would you like a new national park, and if yes, what do you want that to look right. like? So it's presumptive. It's yes. presumptive that the park will exist and then you can contribute contributions to that. <laughs> uh, just before I move on, I should welcome uh, Finlay Carson, our colleague who's joined us this morning uh, while we consider this particular petition. Uh, and Finlay, it's not normally the, pro uh, the, 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 pro the procedure that uh, colleagues can participate in the questioning of witnesses, but I'm very happy, should there come an opportunity, that you would like to ask something, if you indicate to me, and we'll seek to bring you in at, at that point, if you, if you feel it would be helpful. Thank you. Um, Mary, I, I was going to ask you, the, the, N, you know, the, the, the NFUS has said that the existing national parks have failed to make a positive contribution to farming and crofting. That, that's a conclusion I understand has been reached. What drew you to come to that conclusion? We have done multiple member engagement over the years. We've spoken with our members within a national park. And I would like to acknowledge that we do have members who support national park. However, the majority do not. The majority um, tell us that they, it is not working for them. An example of that would be the Cairngorms National Park, where the farmers and crofters had to create their own board to be able to be heard by the Cairngorms National Park Association. So let me just fully understand them. The way I framed the question was the conclusion that it had failed to make a positive contribution. Does that mean then it's made a neutral contribution or does the existence of the National Park, has it created a negative uh, environment for um, farming and crofting? I think it varies in the National Parks and within the areas with it for different members' experiences. Um, I have to apologise, I have not been doing as much with the Cairngorms and the Holman and Trossachs. I've more focused in Dumfries and Galloway and the proposed National Park. But I can come back to the committee with evidence and answer that question. Well, and it may be that these things get teased out as we go along in any event. Um, <clears throat> so let me then ask a general question again. Um, what impact do you consider our existing National Parks have had on the communities who actually live within the boundaries of those national parks and their local economy? And are they, as is required, achieving the statutory aim, which is to promote sustainable and economic development of those local communities? And if there's a concern that's not happening, because that's a statutory obligation of the national park, and what lessons need to be learned or considered before anything further comes to us. And I see Denise Brownlee would like to come in. Um, just that all I can say is, and our No Galloway group have been looking at different things that have been happening in Loch Lomond and Cairngorm to try and engage and find out what might be coming towards us. And we came across an actual Loch Lomond and Trossachs uh, recommendation plan for 2024 to 2029. And page 15 is called The Uncomfortable Truths that this plan aims to tackle. Now, you've got to remember they've been in existence for 20 years. And it's things like, for the ordinary person, 75% of the people cannot afford average houses. Invasive non-native species remain widespread. 50% of the water bodies are not in good ecological condition. Uh, there's, there's just so many... Different statistics, 79% uh, of visitors come into the area by car and then 73% explore the whole area with car. Uh, nothing is joined up. And for us, the environmental aspect, we're already quite he heavy tourist areas down in Dumfries and Galloway. 
and the impact at the moment is bad and bad enough, but seeing the impacts elsewhere after 20 years, I think it would be something that we can't handle. We can't handle those kind of numbers. And that's from a National Park Authority. That's not somebody making up these figures. That's from their own literature. And Mary Dawson, I mean, the NFUS and Nature Scott have commented on the kind of impacts in relation to things like housing and water and transport infrastructure. But the, the kind of, we've got kind of conflicting views. I mean, Nature Scott obviously taking a, a slightly different perspective in all of this. Uh, how do you reconcile, or how, is this again, do you think, um, a consequence of Nature Scott being an advocating proponent of the parks um, and looking to find what it wants to find? Or why, why do these different views kind of exist? I do believe that, unfortunately, Nature Scott are looking to find what they want to find. Um, however, I think there is an issue with the overall process. Um, the people in Dumfries and Galloway and Ayrshire, particularly those in Ayrshire, do not feel their voices are being heard. Um, and there are no answers to many of the questions that we've proposed. It is, it might be this, it might be that. Our members and our communities are being asked to make decisions on a lot of assumptions, no firm facts. And that then brings us to the call for an independent review. Uh, because clearly there is, amongst all of you this morning, I assume, a sense that an investigation led by Nature Scott or a consultation led by Nature Scott is already compromised in the minds of the, the groups that you represent because it would appear that they are there really to act as proponents for the parks and not necessarily to question whether or not the evidence supports the development of further parks. Is that correct? I mean, Mr Kemp, I've not had a chance to, to hear from you. Is there anything you'd like to say just in relation to the commentary that we're having? Uh, yes, if I may. My apologies, I have COVID, so um, uh, I'm at home. Um, uh, I'm actually neutral on the position of national parks. I mean, I know I've been grouped with people who are against at the moment. Um, I'm very clear I've been blogging about national parks for 10 years. Um, but I think the important thing to say about a review is, in fact, the Scottish Government conducted, started a review of national parks in 2008. Um, the first part, which was on governance, was concluded. The second part of that review, which was meant to be on performance, which was about have national parks made any difference in effect, right, was never concluded. Scottish Government started a process of reviewing national parks, and never did. And in my view, that still needs to be done. And I would just like to say here why I'm neutral. is I, I think there is a lot of, in principle... The idea of national parks are a very good idea. But in practice, in my view, they haven't made much difference. And I know there are fears, right? I hear the fears about being overwhelmed by tourists, which are being expressed in La Carbre and Galloway. But the fact is, it's the fairy pools on the sky and NC500, right, have been completely overrun with tourists and they're not in national parks at all. So these factors like uh, attracting tourists don't depend on national parks. And similarly, if we look at land use, I think, um, and the key point to say here is that the national parks have administered exactly the same system that exists in the rest of Scotland. So we have the same planning system, we have the same forestry grant system. We have the same agricultural grant system. If the national parks haven't made much difference to agriculture in the Cairngorms, part of the answer is the national parks have no control over how money is spent on agriculture in the, in the Cairngorms. They can do very little. They've created a tiny fund to compensate for beavers being introduced. That's about the only thing they've done for agriculture in 20 years. So... My position is that actually it, it is because of that that actually, and to come back to your first question about the evidence, we need an independent review to look at the evidence and then to consider actually if we do want national parks and for them to make a difference, what, what, how, what does that mean in terms of extra powers and so on? No, I, I think you make an interesting point in relation to um, 
whether national parks are themselves the catalyst for uh, for additional tourism. And there are other factors as well. I mean, you, you could point to American series television like Outlander and uh, the tourism that comes from all the destinations that arise from that, but is not implicit in the whole idea in the public mind of creating a national park that this is somewhere we should all now go. Uh, and so does it not kind of, I mean, it may not be dependent upon it, but is it is it not almost sort of self-promoting the, co the, the concept that this is actually now somewhere that tourists should consider upping themselves off to uh, because it is a national park? Well, it would be interesting to know whether all the people heading up for the NC500 think that they should go through the Loch Lomond or Trussocks and Cairngorms and stop off on the way. I don't have an answer to that. Right. It would need a, a, a visitor survey. But but actually, you know, it, the Outer Hebrides has just been promoted as the best location on Earth. Right. To visit or one of them, you know, the, in, I think in National Geographic or something. So the, the places are being promoted completely independently of national parks. Um, I, I think that I think the jury's out on a lot of that. Of course, there are hot spots within national parks. There's absolutely no doubt about it. But there are other places in national parks. I mean, you look at the Cowell Peninsula, which has been almost forgotten in the Lomond and Trossachs, could actually probably do with some more tourism. And I'm not sure that the Lomond and Trossachs Park has made much a difference to that. OK, thank you, Mr McKinnon. To highlight that, uh, that one of the impacts on uh, farming in uh, the national parks is the withdrawal of permitted development rights through planning for things like agricultural feed sheds. Um, and if you're a farmer and you wanted to do it, uh, you previously had that as a permitted right. You no longer have that, and you have to go through the planning process. And it's a costly process, and it's a time-consuming process, and there's no guarantee you're going to get it. And it's very much subsistence farming. Uh, and when you have to make that choice, while other areas of the country enjoy that as a permitted right, uh, and again, to highlight the idea that national parks are there to protect and enhance the natural environment. Who are they protecting it from? When Le Haber was put forward, I wanted to know who is attacking Ben Nevis? Who are we, is it, is it the people who live here? And I think that's one of the problems. As you look at national parks around the world, it's the indigenous people. And by indigenous, I mean the people who live and depend on the community and the land and the resources. And I believe that the, we use our resources well in the rural environment. Uh, and I'd like that to be recognised by a group. And, and as well as enhancing and protecting, they're also supposed to promote the use of it through tourism. Uh, and the problem in NC500 and ferry pools uh, isn't tourists, it's the lack of infrastructure. So if you put a national park with all the restrictions to protect the environment in before you introduce the infrastructure, you end up refusing yourself the ability to, to, to provide the infrastructure uh, or making it far more costly. OK. Uh, Thank you. I, I'm going to move to the second theme in our uh, questioning just now, uh, which is the drivers for designating more national parks. I invite David Torrance to take the lead. Thank you, Convener, and good morning to witnesses. And can I put on record um, that I stay in a national park for a good part of the year, which is the Cairngorms? Um, are there circumstances where you would support designations of further national parks for example, following further reviews and consultation with rural stakeholders and industry. Take that. Um, NFUS does not support the creation of new national parks because we don't think they are needed. We think all the aims can be delivered by, in its very name, the new Scottish Agriculture and Rural Communities Act that can provide all those benefits. Um, there are also, certainly in Galloway, there are multiple organisations who can deliver those aims. 
of a national park. And I'd also like it noted that our, the messaging of this new national park has very much moved away from the people who live and work in there and become a climate and biodiversity national park. Our farmers and crofters across the whole of Scotland, not just in Galloway, are already doing an awful lot for climate, nature and biodiversity. That will continue. And we as an organisation and our members are fully supportive of those aims. Can I just, the, the main driver for this uh, third national park in Scotland um, is highlighted uh, as being the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis. The truth of it is that there was only one crisis, and that was the SNP's lack of a parliamentary majority crisis. This was driven by the Butte House Agreement and nothing else. Every other factor in the Butte House Agreement has failed miserably. Uh, and this will too. Uh, it's been highlighted that all national parks should have the support of uh, the people who live there. Uh, and I don't see any areas that have a majority support from the people who live within it. Can I just follow up on that point? Because it's now awful in Galloway. It has become so divisive. It's, it's, it's horrible. It has really divided a community. Can I, can I just come on in that point? Um, because I know consultation with local communities, local groups is really, really important. Um, around the Galloway proposal for a national park, um, how much consultation has been done with local groups, communities, community councils? There's a whole range of the farming union so ourselves, we have done uh, a member survey. We also, uh, I joined NFUS in June last year, and it's been discussed at every one of our regional committee meetings, which happen bi-monthly. Um, in terms of the wider community, uh, I've lived in Galloway since 2015, and I don't think it was very widely um, publicised, as has been intimated. Many, many people say to me, you know, I had no idea, and particularly Ayrshire, that has been a real issue. The members in Ayrshire, South Ayrshire and East Ayrshire, really do not feel they have been consulted. They also feel like it's a done deal. I have many people asking me every week, is this a done deal? What's the point in engaging? And that's terrible for the, the forthcoming consultation process because we need people to engage with that. So they don't feel their voices are being heard. I also have two members who, in the run-up to the bid being submitted, went to community meetings. One was asked, why are you here if you're not here to support a national park? And one was also told when he asked, if your consultation shows a majority against the creation of a new national park in Galloway, will you not put your bid in? And he was told that, no, the bid was going in regardless. Can I just say as well, Denise. the GNPA to Ga Galloway National Park Association, there was very little. There was murmurings occasionally on the ground about a national park, but I can put hand in heart and say never ever saw anything of a meeting or anything like that. The first most of us knew was a BBC news report, which suddenly, you know, we were going to be the next national park, and that's when we started up the No Group. Now, the association said they had extensive community support and spoke to thousands of people, you know. And then when it actually boils down to it, they only quoted a survey of 430 people, right? And 430 people, when you think of the amount, I think it's over 148,000 people. I mean, you can't say that as an extensive support you know, anyway. And then when we were speaking to them, they hadn't consulted people at the health board and, you know, like Karen Ryan, the main, the main players in that area, big employers, they hadn't, they knew nothing about it either. And this was done over six years. And I mean, everybody, as Mary says, is, it has really divided because people are being asked almost to answer questions on what they don't know. You know, we spoke to Nature Scott a few weeks ago 
And the only thing that the only answer that we got, we got one answer, and it was basically yes, the wind farm things will probably happen in a national park. Apart from that, it was it could happen, it's possible it'll happen. That's in principle. There were no hard and fast answers from them, and that caused an even bigger division because we were hoping they would actually, I know that it was just pre the consultation, but we were hoping there would be some answers that would settle things down, but there weren't any. Ian e. McKinnon. Thanks. Can I say in uh, Dame Barbara Kelly, who is the president of the Galloway National Park Association and was part of putting this application forward in her address to the board in 2023, apologised to the other board members for the lack of information and declared it's because a lot of the a lot of the engagement has been done quietly and without publicity that's that's in her statement and I think it highlights the failure in engagement and I would go further and ask you to consider the process what happened in uh, Lachaber the people, seven people decided that they were going to put it forward. Uh, they did not consult with major industry. I don't think they consulted with anybody other than one of their funders, the Gupta organisation. Uh, and they, they didn't engage with fishing, they didn't engage with aquaculture, they didn't engage with landowners other than the Gupta organisation. And this is a major failure in the process. But in, the, in Nature Scott's assessment, Lachaber came out second top. And the same things happened in Galloway. They have not engaged with landowners. And, uh, and there's a real fault in this process. It's undemocratic. It's unfair. It's not transparent. This Scottish government was fair, you know, set up under the banner of fair, equitable and transparent. And this is not happening, I'm afraid. Can't see it. Just oh, Mr. Kemp. Uh, sorry, uh, sorry, Mr. Torrens can't see it. Uh, would you like to contribute to, uh, in respect of this kind of topic? Uh, yeah, it, it, I think it's good because I, I'd agree there are problems about the process. I think expecting the Scottish government expecting local communities to compete with each other for national parks and bids for national parks was just it was going to be a disaster come back to mr mckinnon's point well seven people in lacaba may have got together to have expected seven people to go and negotiate with all the interests other interests was totally and utterly un unrealistic and i can see why local people have ended up being divided on this but what's even worse is that because there isn't a clear idea of what national what a national park would do that has created the division even further and it's why we need a review of existing national parks we need a new model of national parks to say what they're going to be about and then we might be able to take this forward more effectively thank you, thank you for that um one final question the appraisal report noted that there may be complementary or alternative mechanisms for addressing the challenges set out in National Parks' proposals. Other policy approaches or mechanisms you would like to see in advance or in addition instead of designating new National Parks? I would like to see an upgrade of our infrastructure before anything else. Because a lot of the stuff, if you look at SELs, it's about improving tourist infrastructure and different things. I think, first of all, think of the people that live there. Improve our roads. If our road system was better, the A75 and A77, that would actually be a safer, more comfortable road if we are wanting to increase tourism, because everything so far looks like that's what this national park is about, just getting tourists, you know. But they need to improve for the people that live there as well as tourism. And that would be our starter, is the infrastructure of the region. Get it sorted first. Ian I'm just back from Slovenia up in the Alps and driving from there down to Ljubljana. The sides of the roads were spotless. I never saw, I never saw a bin and I didn't see any litter. 
But I drove through uh, Loch Lomond side and stopped within a mile of the National Park headquarters where there were three bins full to overflowing. This was at the beginning of March. I was going down to see the blockheads. Uh, and so it wasn't the busy season. Those bins were full to overflowing and had blown all over the verge. Uh, and since then, coming down in the bus, I've looked at the verges in, along Loch Lomond side, and they're hideous. And there's nothing that we can do because they can't safely, without closing the road, go and pick up the litter. Um, I don't know. Mickey Mouse in Florida can take in 50,000 people a day. He can feed them, he can park them, and he can pick up their litter. I never saw a bit of litter in Disneyland. Tourism is one of our most important industries. We're failing uh, in delivering the most basic things at places like uh, the, the ferry pools. I live at the mouth of the Mora River. And two days of sunshine and the, the bins are full to overflowing. Uh, the toilets are, are not looked after. Um, the Highland Council gave them up because they don't have the funds. And the local, the local community group took them on. And they are now begging uh, for money to, to keep them updated. Uh, if we can't provide the most basics, uh, you know, litter, toilet and parking, and we're not doing that in our existing national parks. We shouldn't be considering a future one, and we're destroying one of our most important industries. Okay. I have no further questions. OK, thank you. Um, I, I should say uh, Mickey Mouse may facilitate all that with a smile, but he fleeces your wallet while he's doing it. <laughs> <laughs> have to charge to provide good service, then we should be, because we're destroying. Look at what's happened to Spain. Spain has never recovered and probably never will recover uh, its identity. It's a great place to go. It's still regarded as cheap and cheerful. And I don't want to see that happen to okay. Scotland. Uh, Mary Dawson, I just wanted to follow up on one response that I heard you give to David Torrance when you, you got uh, almost quite emotional and passionate about the, divi divi the division mm. and the, it, that it's created. And I, I, I wondered if you could illustrate h how that's manifested itself. Um, I think if there's one thing I would like the committee to take away today is please do not underestimate the level of feeling in Galloway and Ayrshire. It is, it's now getting to the point it's not pleasant working on this, regardless of whether you are a proponent of the proposal or not. Um, I have members who have been on the phone to me in tears because they are worried about the future for their children and their grandchildren. There are so many family businesses down in Galloway, agricultural family businesses, and they are worried about their future because we do not know what this would look like. Thank you. I'm going to move to the, the, the next theme, which is, is engagement process and, and local buy-in, uh, nicely following on from your comments there, and ask Morris Golden if he would like to take the lead. Uh, uh, thank you, Convener. It, it, it strikes me from the evidence we've heard so far that perhaps the starting point in all of this is a definition of what a national park is and indeed what it should uh, achieve. Um, for some people, it might be a, a pristine landscape without any land management, in which case biodiversity will undoubtedly reduce. And uh, looking at, and I'll maybe come to Nick Kemp first, uh, looking at Loch Lomond and Trossachs, there is clearly um, lots of tourism uh, occurring there. Loch Lomond Shores has um, amazing facilities to attract tourists, but then the same national park didn't want further tourists to um, uh, go there. So I think before you get to presenting to the people of Galloway, we need a starting point as to what it is we are presenting. So. Nick, you've kind of touched on this, but I wonder if you could, uh, based on the two existing national parts, is there an adequate definition of what 
a new national park might look like and the experience for both visitors and local residents? Right. Well, I, my view is that the statutory aims, the four statutory aims of Scotland's national parks are good. I know the government has talked about tweaking them, right? But actually, I think they're basically good. They're conservation of the natural and cultural heritage, promoting public enjoyment, wise use of resources and sustainable development of the area's local communities. I don't think many... I think the Scottish Parliament got that absolutely right first time. The problem is, is that there's been no mechanisms to make that happen. And as I previously said, right, it's exactly the same planning system is applied in the national parks as elsewhere. It's the same rural subsidy system, right? It's the same type of forestry. So if we get to the... Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, for example, <clears throat> it's dominated by industrial forestry. It's dominated by Sitka. And actually, despite lots of talk from the National Park about we need to diversify our forests, we need to make them more resilient against disease. There's lots of larch, by the way, being felled in the Lomond Park because of disease. We've, we've got completely the wrong model of forestry. But actually, nothing has been done to change that in the Lomond Park. What's happened is Forest and Land Scotland has gone on operating, which owns most of the land for forestry, has gone on operating just the same. And it's the same with the other partners. Some of the other speakers have said about, you know, improving roads and so on, uh, improving transport connections. Our national parks have been unable to, they, they've been supposed to operate in partnership, and they have these partnership plans with other organisations, but they proved to, they're totally incapable of making those organisations do things. And again, Mr McKinnon referred to all the litter down Loch Lomond. And the problem is they can't even persuade local councils, right, to put out litter bins. Right? They can't even do that. Mm. So it's actually that the, the national parks are very, very weak. And I think that's why we need to have a, a review, an independent review of them, to look at it, look at actually how they could be strengthened and be made more effective. And, and that should start with the existing ones. And then people would have a better idea about what a national park would mean elsewhere. Uh, th thanks for that. And perhaps we're moving to the panel in the room, just thinking about that definition, do the people of Galloway actually... Um, understand what is being presented and is there a clear vision of that and uh, probably wrapped around that is what formal process have Nature Scott or um, indeed the Scottish Government uh, conducted to date on this? Well, Denise, as, like as far as I'm aware not an awful lot, as I say it was the Galloway National Park Association, the first people we heard, mm -hmm. and then we actually organised Nature Scott to come out and speak so that people were hopefully getting a balanced view of everything. But they couldn't, they could not give any hard and fast answers on anything, and I really mean on anything, what the park would meet. It was nothing it could do, that everything was it could do, perhaps that will happen. There was no, like Nick's just saying, the aims of a national mm -hmm. park. They never even said that. They just could not answer any questions. And what I worry about as well is, because I lived in Loch Lomond and I was a ranger up mm -hmm. there for a couple of years, and it's things like about the conserve and enhance the natural and cultural heritage and all that sort of stuff. Well, in the past, you could almost camp. The teenagers did camp anywhere on Loch Lomond, you know, you'd find a wee spot and stick your tent up and have a weekend party and things like that. Of course, now you can't. You need a mm. permit to camp everywhere with the bylaws because, again, rangers and the authority don't have teeth like police, you know, so now rather than make the bad campers pay, everyone has to pay. And the same uh, was with the launching boats. Uh, the National Park took over the public slipway, which was built, bequeathed, sorry, to the people. And that's the only place now that you can actually launch a boat. So if you go up to Loch Lomond with a boat, now you've got to pay £37.20 to get it on the water. Whereas in the past, you'd just take it up. So that's actually a bit of the, what do you say, the cultural heritage instantly that's lost about using the lock side 
for the people up there. So th there's all of these... <sighs> I know I'm rambling a little bit, but I am because we have no hard and fast answers about what this proposed park is about. And they weren't even using the word proposed until I, I sort of got a bit angry about it because it was National Park, was, you know, New National Park in Galloway. They were keeping saying New National Park in Galloway. And it's like, no, it's not a New National Park. It's a proposed mm. National Park. So I, I think... There's kind of two parts to this. The first is the Scottish Government said that any new national park should be in response to local community demand. Now, in order to ascertain that local community demand, I would assume that the Scottish Government and Nature Scott would deliver a balanced view of the, the, the national park. For example, you know, there's economic benefits, but actually that brings a lot more footfall, litter, as we've heard. You know, was it presented that way? And also specifically, what process has gone on so far? Has it been community meetings? Has it been social media campaigns? I, I mean from Nature Scott and the, and, and the Scottish Government on this. Nature Scott set up a hub where people could answer questions, but it wasn't a do you want a national park, yes or no? The questions were also skewed and so biased, a sort of one to ten sliding scale. And where was that hub? It was on uh, it was a hub page on the computer. Oh, right, so you okay. had to be you had to be able to use a computer to access this hub and fill out different tiles about what a national park could bring to you. You know, there you didn't have a yes or no, we don't want a national park, even though we were typing that sort of information in. So okay. everything was so biased. But then people using this hub that was called the Commonplace Hub by Nature Scott, but people started using that as a propaganda thing against our No Galloway National Park group. Rather than actually saying anything about the national park, they were taking a pop at us and being quite aggressive on it. We did actually ask Nature Scott to remove the comments and they refused. OK, thanks. I'll go to Mary then, Ian. But, Mary, I guess what we've heard so far is that, uh, firstly, there's not a clear understanding from Nature Scott or the Scottish Government over the proposition for Galloway and, and secondly, the consultation process thus far has been inadequate. What's your assessment? Um, yes, uh, so we have the four national park aims, but we are constantly told a, a potential New Galloway and Ayrshire National Park w could be different, mm -hmm. but not how it could be different. And uh, the formal consultation period opens um, next week, yep. a week commencing the 4th of November. I know we are going to be offered three different boundaries as a starting point. So again, we're not even being offered one option. We are being offered multiple options. Um, I would like to say um, Nature Scott have been good at engaging with NFUS. We have had multiple okay. meetings, which we are um, very grateful for, and we will continue to do that. They have committed to coming down to speak to our farmers in Ayrshire and De Vries and Galloway. Um, on the hub on, online, I would comment that it was very difficult to navigate and use, so that would have put off a certain demographic of the community. And the information leaflet wh that was sent out was, it was either five or six weeks late. So I do have concerns that any further communications that are sent out in paper with a limited 12-week period for consultation will we have enough time, will the residents of Galloway have enough time to be able to look at what they're saying and engage with it? Mm -hmm. So would it be your assessment, and we've actually seen this with one of our other petitions around what are colloquial uh, referred to as pylons, that actually the consultation was, these are coming, um, so there's no, no option here. Is that, from what you've seen so far, and I know the formal consultation is to start, but is, is that the way it's been framed, that this is coming and your options are essentially what the boundaries are? I believe they have now said they will offer a chance 
for people to say, no, I do not want a national park. However, given the process up till now, we do have concerns if that will appear and also how, mu how much of that message will be sent, because the whole tone of the messaging so far has been new national park, not proposed national park. Which is fine, as long as you don't state that one of your aims is response to local community demand. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, you know, if it's a policy decision, this must happen, that is up to the Scottish Government, but you can't then say it's because the community support it, I would argue. It, it reeks a bit of George Or Orwell, 1984. Um, Ian, would you like to come in? I came, but thank you. I came before the Petitions Committee back about 2008 or 2007, <clears throat> again with the help of <clears throat> Fergus Ewing, who was our MSP then, um, asking that a local referendum be, uh, be a part of the National Parks Act. Um, and when we met with Lorna Slater, when she was the minister, we asked again, can we get a local referendum? And she said there's no mechanism within the Park Act to allow for that. Um, so again, people are, being con people are being consulted about what's going to happen rather than being given a choice. And that's very evident in the way that the business has been conducted in Galloway over the, well, since the beginning of the whole process. Mm -hmm. uh, it's evident. Can I, can I just say about uh, the leaflet that came out as well? Every single household was meant to get a copy of this mm -hmm. leaflet. Needless to say, lots of people didn't get it because apparently you only got it if the postman was delivering mail that day. And a lot of, obviously, Galloway is very outlying areas, so a lot of people didn't get it. Also, when it comes to the hub and different other things like that, our age demographic down there, you know, a lot of people don't use the internet or the computer and all the rest of it. Plus, large parts of it can't get broadband anyway unless they spend a fortune. So it's not even a fair way of getting... I don't know how you would get in touch with everybody, but to actually consult and speak to everybody, it's not worked so far what they've done. Thanks. And maybe just to finish off, Denise, what would be your, your top three concerns around a new national park in Galloway? Well, my personal... Everyone's is different, obviously. My personal one is the house prices, mm -hmm. right? Because already there's quite a few, as I would call, honeypot towns and villages in the area mm -hmm. where you go at the dead of winter and there's not one house light on because they're all second homes, holiday lets... Yep. Etc. The other thing is the to we're getting pushed on the tourism front. You know that there's all these jobs going to come, but the reality is they'll be low-paid tourism type jobs, and I want more for the youngsters in the area. And I mean, again, when I said the infrastructure, I would love to see the infrastructure sorted so that we are a more how would I put it? More people can travel to and from the area. More connected, that's the word. OK, thank you. And, Mary, final question to you from, a, if you like, a land management and farming perspective. Is there potential benefits to farming and crofting as a result of this new national park, based on your discussions with Nature Scott? Um, so, Nature Scott declined, and correctly so, declined to answer that when they were asked it, because they are meant to be neutral. However, in our meetings with the Galloway National Park Association, the only benefits that I was offered were um, diversification opportunities. And that's fine if you want to diversify, but there are, there are many of our farming businesses who just want to concentrate on food production. And the other benefit was access to experts. And as we know, diversification gets into tourism, which we've heard, wind turbines, solar farms, battery storage. Yes. OK, thank you. Back to you, convener. Thank you very much, Mr Golden. The fourth and final theme that we wish to explore with you this morning is, relates to the forthcoming legislation on the national parks and the potential uh, national park statement, including the implications of pursuing reform 
and designation on a twin park. And Mr Chowdhury, I'm going to invite to ask some questions in relation to that. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the Scottish Government has proposed to make changes to national park legislation in a bill due to come out later in this parliamentary year. Uh, what are the implications of this process running alongside the investigation of a new designation? Are stakeholders aware of the changes being proposed? Can I? Yeah, I can say that we are aware that there are changes being proposed. I do not know what those changes are. However, I would, what I would say is, how again, how can we be asked to take a decision on the designation of a new national park when potentially the legislation that that sits under is going to change? I think one of the things is that uh, there's never been a national park that has been deparked. Once you're a national park, you're a national park, and basically you're signing a blank cheque for the future. What we do know is in national parks, and this comes from the Office of uh, National Statistics, and I also believe from the Loch Lomond and Trossachs and uh, the, the Cairn Gorhams, is that they have a, an older group of people. Um, the, the, the age tends to be older by, I think, a quite cons significant four plus years. Uh, average earnings tend to be lower. There's, there's less young people and families. Um, there's also less ethnic and religious diversity within national parks, according to the Office of National Statistics. Um, there seems to be a higher level of uh, further education, uh, and maybe that's just rich, educated people retiring there. Um, but this has implications for, for the communities all the way through. We're already struggling to find people uh, to take on care jobs. Up in Le Haber, there's three perfectly good care homes that are closed because they can't get the, the, the people. And generally, it was women, working, uh, mothers, who took on these jobs part-time to look after the elderly. And so when you don't have that, infra that infrastructure, that human infrastructure, we're having to hire in people through agencies and the costs go through the roof. And I do think it's important that we, ha we have to consider these additional issues. May I ask, uh, I mean, did I hear that, that you said uh, you're not aware of the, uh, the proposed so what, what do you think that Scottish Government should do to get the stakeholders involved more on uh, when they're making any changes on legislation? Can I say that one of the things that I think they should do is stop using the word stakeholders, right? That's as far as I'm concerned. If you live, work and live in an area through choice, you are a stakeholder because everything depends on you living there. I don't know what the Scottish Government could do to make us more aware because this, no, you know, the national park thing that we are fighting at the moment, there are some, still some people that are quite unaware that it's going to affect them, especially as Mary was saying, in their shire, that sort of side of the world. We are still speaking to you know, every day there's somebody else that didn't actually understand that it was going to affect them, so I don't know how the Scottish Government can get this information down to everybody. Does Nick want to say anything now? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, please. Thanks. It's a good question. My view is there are some minor tweaks to the aims of national parks, which is basically giving a bit more emphasis to climate change and nature. They were already built into the statutory aims of national parks, and I don't think it's necessary to to tweak the aims to do that. What I think the Scottish Government hasn't looked at uh, clearly at the moment is actually about um, uh, the powers and resources of national parks. I've mentioned that before. If they're going to make a difference, they, do they need to have more power and resources? But also, in respect to Galloway, I think it's worth pointing out that some very basic issues, like the size of a national park, are two existing national parks span four or five local authorities, right, and they brought together 
They they meant to bring together coordination across different local authority areas. Galloway would be totally different. It's in one local authority area. Right? So actually, that your whole governance of the national park needs to be fundamentally different. And that's not being... Uh, and in fact, all the other alternatives for national parks, most of them are in Highland Council. So it's going to need a new model of national parks, how the national park relates to a single local authority. And that's just not being considered at the moment. Mary. Can I just come back on that? Because the proposed boundary as it sits just now takes in South Ayrshire and East Ayrshire Council but this is the problem I know Dumfries and Galloway Council is the majority but this goes back to my other point about Ayrshire not being consulted the whole thing has been branded Galloway not Galloway and Ayrshire Thank, uh, my last question is uh, Net Nature Scott has also made other recommendations on how national parks should be run. For example, that there should be more involvement of communities and different sectors in developing national park plans, and that funding streams should be available to deliver the plans. What are your views on this? Are there further changes you would like to see to how national parks are governed or supported that would help to address concerns you have about existing or future national parks? Um, to come in on that um, from a Galloway National Park proposal, um, as I've already said, the very, by its very name, the new Agricultural and Rural Communities Act should be able to deliver those aims. We don't need a national park to do that. We've already got a lot of really good things happening on the ground in Galloway as well. We've got the Forest Park, we've got Dark Skies, we've got Biosphere. We've got all these different things that are already up and running. And to me, if there is additional money for a national park, that money should be put into the things that Mary's already said I'm mentioning. There's lots of them. And if we're going to promote an area, promote these things because they're already on the ground, employing local people that live locally. I don't believe that Nature Scott are an impartial uh, and unbiased organisation. They're an, an agent, government agency acting on their own behalf, a quango. Um, and I don't believe that they, that they give valid scientific evidence to, to government. Um, and if it, you want uh, to get messages to the public, don't involve Nature Scott. I believe I highlighted whenever talking about marine biodiversity. They ignore what's happening on the ground in favour of cherry-picking one incident uh, to do with uh, birds, uh, marine birds, ignoring the others. So uh, I certainly feel that nature, Scott, needs to be looked at, or Scottish natural heritage. Is, uh, you can change your name, but uh, everybody still knows who you are. Thank you very much. A moral there in so many different ways. Uh, Mr Carson, um, you've been listening patiently uh, to the evidence. And just before I draw this particular panel's uh, consideration to an end, I wonder if there's anything you would like to uh, put potentially. Hey, thanks, convener. Um, I suppose it, one of my biggest concerns is that we've heard about all the, the downsides of national parks in Scotland and, and the government's engaged uh, are committed to deliver at least one new national park in Scotland by the end of 2026. Should, that have wait, should the government have waited until lessons had been learnt from the existing parks? And should have, and I know it's, somebody touched on it, uh, should there be a formal independent review of the current national parks to see what lessons could be learnt? Because in, in some instances there may be uh, some benefits that national park status can deliver to some areas. Uh, but we don't know what those might be because we haven't actually reviewed the work that's already been undertaken and the, and the, the benefits and the, 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 the drawbacks of national park status. So, so I'd like to ask the panel what your views are on potentially pausing this whole um, commitment to new national parks until a, a thorough review has been done of the existing. Um, yes, I believe that uh, a review of the existing parks 
would be beneficial. Uh, as I've said multiple times today, we do not know what we're being asked to sign up to. How can we make informed decisions on no information? I also agree that a total independent assessment should be done. And actually, you know, breaking it down the way you would with a job, have they met their aims and objectives? Because they've been on the go for 20 years. So if they haven't managed in 20 years, should they be reviewed? Once that's done, then let's see the way forward. I can only agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Only, I, I, I've got to take issue with uh, some of the sentiments about, because it's sort of conflicting. So we have Marie uh, suggesting there that, uh, that you don't know what you're deciding on yet. And we've got someone else saying it's all in stone, it's a done deal, and, and, but there's lots of uncertainty. But is that not because actually the formal consultation doesn't start till next week? Where they will set out the, the, the considerations that the, the, the public are going to make. So that may be on boundaries. It may be on uh, planning uh, authority status of a new national park. It may be the makeup of the, the board of the new national park. So we, are we we're not jumping the gun by saying that we, we, Nature Scott failed when actually that process is just about to be undertaken? Um, and I know the NFUS say no to national parks, but when it comes to the Galloway National Park, what are, what's the NFU actually saying no to? What policies that are yet to be decided are the NFU saying no to? Um, so we don't believe national parks are required because we think the aims of national parks, as they are set out just now, can be delivered through the Agricultural and Rural Communities Bill. The emphasis on this new national park has been biodiversity and climate, which our members across the country, not just in Galloway, all our farmers and crofters, are already working towards those aims. The done deal uh, refers to the designation rather than the detail. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we don't know a lot that's going to happen, but we do know that <coughs> the priorities are going to be um, protection and enhancement of the natural environment. I'd still like to know who, it's need, who uh, it needs to be protected against. And I would also highlight that we do know that uh, the whole process so far has been severely biased in favour of a park. Even today, and running for the next two days, there's a pro-park exhibition in here for the next uh, three days proposed by Colin Smith, uh, MSP. And that, that opportunity has not been afforded to the people who are against the National Park. So I think we do, you know, the, the concern that this whole process has been uh, biased and pushed forward is a real concern. And we know that. So the gentleman in line like to comment on any of the yeah. questions? Well, I, I think a review would help in answer to your question, because I think people need to be very clear about actually what our national parks have done and not done. I think many of the fears and misgivings about our national parks actually aren't justified um, because they haven't really actually changed anything. So, um, I th so I think an independent review is needed. But what then is needed is for the Scottish Government and for the Scottish Parliament to actually review and this comes into legislation about what national parks should be doing if they're going to make a difference. Um, and I would just say, and it's not up to me to talk to, I used to be in the Scottish campaign for national parks, and you're, I know your speakers are coming on uh, next about it and will say something about it, but I go down to Galloway quite a lot. And, you know, the big challenges there in terms of the landscape and it being a national park is what happens to wind farms, what do we do about the Sitka, uh, which is just, I mean, everyone, it's just predominantly Sitka forestry, which has lost rural jobs and so on. So how do you make, create more sustainable rural employment, bring in broadleaf trees and so on? So some really big land use questions that need to be answered. And I'm not sure that this consultation that's coming up in uh, about, about to happen is actually going to set out clear parameters for that at all. In fact, I'd be very surprised if it does. Thank you, convener. OK, uh, thank you all very much. So, uh, Denise Brownlee, Mary Dawson, Ian McKinnon and Nick Kemp, I'm very grateful to you for the contribution you've made this morning. Uh, I think we've... Uh, 
teased out your views on a whole range of issues arising from the proposed national park, and that will be of great interest and help to us as a committee as we consider what steps to take next. So thank you again, and I'll now suspend the, this meeting for a brief time to allow the panel to change. Thank you very much.
So we welcome back to this meeting of the uh, Citizens Participation and Public Petitions Committee. We are continuing our evidence now in relation to petition number PE 2089 to stop more national parks in Scotland. And following the evidence we heard from our previous panel, we've been joined by uh, Rob Lucas from the Galloway National Park Association and John Mayhew from the Scottish Campaign for National Parks. Very warm welcome to both of you. Um, and uh, as again, can I say that uh, our colleague Finlay Carson is sitting in on this uh, petition this morning. Uh, so I think we'll move straight to uh, questions. And we've got four themes. I don't know if you were able to watch or, or, or hear any of the evidence that we took in relation to the first panel. So, so along the similar themes. So I'm interested, um, you know, what evidence is available on uh, this seemed to be one of the, the issues relating to um, the parks. What evidence is available on the environmental and socio-economic impacts that the existing national parks um, have been able to generate? Did any of that evidence, if it existed, inform the development of this proposal? Um, and where there wasn't evidence, where did those gaps draw their information in support of the proposal from? The way that we know what the uh, existing national park authorities have achieved is through their reporting mechanism. So the, the staff of the national park are responsible to the National Park Authority Board, and then they are responsible to the Scottish Government, to, to ministers. And so they've been in existence for over 20 years now, and every year they've uh, been reported reporting on their activities and what they've achieved for the area under their four aims. Um, and the other way in which you can read about uh, what they've been doing is through their National Park Partnership Plan. So the National Park authorities are obliged uh, to come up with a, a partnership plan, uh, which is not just their plan, it's working with all the other public agencies in the area, such as the local authorities and the other government agencies, such as Forestry and Land Scotland or Nature Scott, health boards, police boards, all of these people. Um, and that's part of the strength of the National Park model, that it encourages, in fact it insists, on all of those agencies in the area working together uh, to, to uh, implement the four aims of the national parks, which we've heard about earlier on, conservation and recreation and sustainable use and community development. So there's a great deal that's been done um, over those years. Um, I'm sure the national park authorities would be the first to admit that there's a great deal still to do, um, but there's a solid record of progress which they've made, uh, which we think is sufficient that it's worthwhile extending that model to other parts of Scotland, which we genuinely think could benefit from. Thank you, Mr Mayhew. Mr Lucas? Uh, yes, I think in the, in the local context, obviously we're you, drawing on information. Uh, there are a number of data sets where, uh, for instance, in census data and other uh, national statistics, where uh, national parks are uh, drawn out from as a, as a unique data set. Uh, and we've drawn not only on Scotland, but also on some of the English parks, uh, which we think have relevance because they are perhaps more, more alike to, um, to Galloway than perhaps the Cairngorms, for instance, in terms of its landscape. I think, do you want me to go on? Well, well I'm only, as you no, no, I think that answers the question. Yeah. yeah. Um, you will have heard the the evidence um, during the last session, and various um, uh, of those who were contributing felt that there needed to be an independent review of the national parks, um, and that this really was something that was needed over and above any kind of review that was being conducted by Nature Scott. Uh, I think one of the panellists referred to Mr Ewing's contribution when we first considered the petition about people marking their own homework, about the fact that Nature Scott are proponents of what is being now advocated in relation to an additional national park, so that there isn't the public confidence that there has been a proper understanding independently generated of the benefits uh, and lessons that can be learned uh, in generating uh, any in in creating any future national park what what's your attitude in relation to the calls of the petitioner for such a, an independent view to be established um, we do understand why this is being proposed um, 
However, we have noted that much of the extensive debate that's gone, over, gone on over the last three years since the proposal was first made uh, about the process towards a new national park and also where it should be, that is inevitably focused on the work of the existing national parks because the, the obvious question is, uh, if we want to have a new national park, is it worth it on the evidence that, that has been so far? And this has been uh, discussed uh, repeatedly at the various opportunities that, that there have been to debate the work. So I won't go right back to the, be the beginning, but there was a full-scale public consultation on the future of national parks in Scotland in 2022. Uh, the government then asked Nature Scott to give more detailed advice on the approach to selecting new national parks. That included two further rounds of public consultation. And then there's this debate, which I know you discussed in the early discussion, about uh, possible legislative amendments and whether we should be seeking to change the legislation for national parks either before the new one uh, is proposed or at some point in the future, depending on the legislative timetable. Um, and then there was the, the big consultation last year, the big biodiversity consultation led by the Scottish Government. Uh, including possible amendments to the forthcoming Act, um, the, sorry, the forthcoming Natural Environment Bill. There's a proposal that the National Park Act might be amended as part of that bill. So there's been this three, three yes, more than three year propo um, process with a, a great deal of debate um, through all those different mechanisms through the Nature Scott consultations, well, through the Scottish Government consultations. You, you say that, Mr Mayhew, yeah. but is a consultation the same thing as a review? No. I, I mean, because, mm. I mean, I, I don't live in an area that uh, is likely to be affected by a national park. I live in the most beautiful constituency that there is, yeah. of course, Of course you Scotland, do. Of course but you do. Yes. Nonetheless, we don't, have the, we don't have a national park within it. But uh, my, my local council is forever holding consultations. And, I mean, I'm forever being besieged with consultations for this, that and the next thing. Mm. And, I mean, part of my kind of, if I was just being a layperson, is I've become a bit suspicious of public consultations because they're ten a penny. It's almost exhausting. Mm -hmm. uh, very often, you know, you'll contribute to a public consultation and, and it'll tell you, 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 can, you your answer can contain 85 characters and no more. And, you know, the pro forma of these things becomes quite restrictive. Um, and if there is a kind of underlying suspicion that the consultation is by the supporting organisation trying to find a mandate to progress with what it wishes to do in the first place, people then think, well, what's the point? Whereas a, an independent review is, in the public mind, surely a more objective uh, analysis of evidence um, and more widespread. I mean, we heard, I think, in the previous panel that one consultation that could potentially have reached several hundred thousand people had attracted 430 responses or something. Is that really a consultation? Um, I certainly share some of your frustrations, Convener, with uh, actually trying to partake in, in some consultations. The, the characters in the box, I, do, I certainly know what you mean about that. Um, no, a, a consultation is not the same as a review, although a review would be subject to the same criticism that there has been about whether government agencies can be truly independent, because inevitably the review would be paid for by the government, and therefore those seeking to disagree with it could reasonably argue that the review wasn't independent because it was paid for by the government which wanted to see a particular policy implemented. There is no other solution. You, you, it, it certainly uh, wouldn't be an independent review if it was carried out by us or by the National Park Association or by those that are opposed to national parks. It, that wouldn't be independent either. I think the important thing about consultation is that it doesn't just happen, but that the results are analysed and published. And I know that the Scottish Government has a standard process for doing that. So when it carries out a consultation, um, it then hands over the results of that um, to an, an independent third party, uh, a consultancy, and asks them to prepare an analysis of what everybody said, what were the main points that were given, what's the balance of opinion, and what should therefore come out of, of that consultation. So not just consultation for its own sake, but a, a set of results and proposals. But given that the national parks have been there, you know, for a couple of decades, is a review not a perfectly reasonable proposition? I, I was listening to Nick Kemp talking in the earlier session, and he was describing 
the, the time back in, I think it was about 2009, 2010, when there was a review of the national parks, and at that point we were disappointed that that review didn't extend to their achievements, their performances, their successes, their failures. Uh, it was very much about the processes by which they were managed and their governance systems. And so at, at, at that point we certainly felt that uh, a review should have been taken. There, there wasn't at that point the idea that it would be independent. The assumption was it would be carried out by the Scottish Government as the organisation ultimately responsible uh, for national parks. I think where we are now um, is to, to address the petitioner's requests directly that they would like to see the process suspended. Uh, we believe that that lengthy process which I've described should be allowed to run its course uh, and it shouldn't be suspended because the, there's been this very thorough process to date uh, which has given ample opportunity to debate whether we should have another national park and if so where it should be um, and there's more stages of that to go. Um, Nature Scott's been very much in engagement mode up till now. It hasn't been consultation for the last few weeks. It's simply been trying uh, as best they possibly can to let everybody in Galloway and the, the, bits of Ayrshire, the relevant bits of Ayrshire know that this is on the table, that there's a proposal from the Scottish Government, this is what might, it might mean, and there is then a formal consultation coming up. Um, so we, uh, I'd also like to be clear that... Um, my understanding is, and I, please correct me if I'm wrong, that once Nature Scott has finished that formal consultation, it then must provide its advice to ministers, and that advice could be uh, that ministers should go ahead with the National Park, or it could be their advice that they shouldn't. There is then a further point that once ministers have received that advice, they can then choose to take it or choose not to take it. So Nature Scott is being asked to do a professional piece of work, but it's the Scottish ministers as the democratically accountable people who have the, then the decision whether to go ahead or not. So it's possible that Nature Scott should advise to go ahead and that ministers decide for other reasons that they've taken into consideration that they shouldn't go ahead. Even if Nature Scott advise go ahead, ministers decide to go ahead, ultimately the designation order for the National Park has to come before the entire Scottish Parliament. That's what it says in the Act, and that's quite right, because this is an important change to Scotland that we're considering here, and it's quite right that the highest body in the land, which is the entire Scottish Parliament, should ultimately make that decision. So I do think all of that process that I've described, what's happened so far and what is still to run, provides a, a really remarkably thorough and detailed process for considering this very important issue, and that's why we feel it should be allowed to run its course. Okay. I mean, I, I suppose I can, I'm speaking in an entirely personal capacity here, but uh, as convener of this committee, I have to say we've had Nature Scott before us in relation to other petitions, and I've found them mm -hmm. deeply unconvincing and totally unpersuasive. So I, I don't actually, uh, when I hear the expression Nature Scott, it doesn't sing to me as an organisation who always are terribly in touch, uh, it seems to me, with the aims of petitions. But, I, I, but that's my view. I can't speak about half of the committee when I say that. Mr Lucas, is there anything you'd like to contribute in that regard? Um, I think... In terms of the process going on, I think um, then I think the process being take, undertaken in Galloway started uh, a long time ago. The council commissioned a report uh, on whether a national park was a way forward, um, and uh, that was really the start of our campaign. I think um, I think it is a, a separate question of um, do you undertake a review of national parks? I think. Um, I don't think Galloway National Park Association is qualified to answer that question. I think it's a technical question um, which is um, not within our remit, really. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm interested because we need to, I need to move along and bring colleagues in, but a similar question to the one I asked uh, to the, the previous panel. In relation to the impact on people actually living within the national parks um, and the, econ the economy on which they depend, uh, you know, what impact have national parks actually had? Shall I go, go first again? Um, the, the largest part of the economy in the two existing national parks is uh, visitor related. It's the, it's the visitor economy, so it's um, self catering and bed and breakfasts and cafes and restaurants and all, all the, and the, the outdoor experience operators and all the people that. Um, 
that provide for the, the visitors that, that like to come to the national parks. Um, and in those, they're, they're, they've been very successful. Um, I can. I don't have the figures immediately in front of me, but I can I can find them. And certainly, I know that the, um, the the scale of the visitor economy in those two existing national parks is far far larger than the amount of money which the Scottish government, the relatively small amount of money which the Scottish government puts in, which it costs to run a national park. Um, now, you could say that's it's not possible to say how much of that is due to the designation of the National Park and how much of it is due to the attractiveness of the area and the effectiveness of local businesses in uh, catering to those visitors and generating uh, employment and generating business. But I think um, certainly the scale of the visitor economy in both of those places uh, is testament to the, the ongoing success from that point of view. Galloway, and I I'll obviously want Rob to come in on this as well, Galloway is a little different in that it does have a successful visitor economy, but uh, I believe the National Park Association feels that it would be possible to have a modest increase in that without damaging the very beauty of the place and the, the, the attractive qualities of the place which visitors like to come to see. And if that were to be possible, that would create jobs for young people, it would create income for businesses, um, it would create opportunities, it would create potential for the area. Um, and one of the reasons that some people in Galloway are enthusiastic about having a national park is that they feel a little bit left behind and they feel that visitors who come to Scotland tend to go to Edinburgh, Glasgow and the Highlands and wouldn't it be wonderful if they came to Galloway because it's such a beautiful place. Um, I hope I've characterise that correctly, uh, Rob. Um, national parks are a, they're a real opportunity for local people to, to get involved with because they do have this, uh, the, these four aims which they have to, uh, which we've heard already about this morning, which they have to achieve together. And one of them, quite rightly, is looking after the social and economic development of local communities. And I should say that although I'm talking on behalf of SCNP, which is an environmental organisation, and we work closely with APRS, Action to Protect Rural Scotland. This is another environmental organisation. Of course, our primary interest is in nature, in wildlife, in scenery, in landscape. But that doesn't mean that when we are opposed in any way to the social and economic development of local communities. Far from it. These things go, in hand, go hand in hand. And there are people living and working in the existing national parks who work in wildlife tourism, they work in forestry, they work in agriculture, they work in providing outdoor recreation activities, they work in all of the businesses which help people to enjoy the place and also which maintain its landscape and which look after the special qualities of the place which the national park was created to conserve um, and which it's charged to maintain. Um, so I hope that goes some way towards answering your, your question. Mr Lucas, do you wish to add? Yes, I mean, I think um, I have the, I suppose, the benefit of I used to run a national um, environmental education charity um, which operated across the UK, uh, roughly half the places, uh, yeah, about half the sites were in uh, national parks and half weren't. Um, I can say it was a lot easier to attract people to work in those centres. It was a lot easier to market those places that were in national parks. Um, the national park brand is a very powerful way of bringing people uh, to an area, and an area which currently is very under-recognised. And um, it is, you know, many people have never heard of Galloway. Um, and one, when we undertook our discussions, um, we had uh, over a hundred uh, meetings with everything from community councils, of which roughly a quarter of those community councils were in the Ayrshires, uh, the relevant bits of the Ayrshires. Uh, we had some public meetings, we met with stakeholder groups, um, we met with schools. So we had a fairly broad range and we spoke to well over 2,000 people. And it was very clear that two messages came through. First of all, they wanted to put Galloway on the map and they felt a national park could do that because with that would come some recognition. Uh, and the second reason was that they felt that Galloway was a place that things were done to and not done with. 
and they felt a national park and the planning process, the partnership planning process that goes with that, uh, would actually help bring back some of that sense of um, control of destiny of the area, uh, which they felt had moved towards the, the Dumfries uh, end of the, of the area. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to let uh, Mr Torrance take us into the second of the themes which you may have recalled from the last session is drivers for designating more national parks. Mr Torrance. Cassie, thank you very much, convener, and welcome to the panel. Um, I'm actually going to continue just on a theme that the convener was on there earlier about communities and um, businesses and industry in national parks. As somebody who has stayed for 35 years in Aviemore and watched its decline to its designation as a national park and a huge investment has been put in the area, um, whether it's in the tourist industry, hospitality, an investment, especially in the hospitality, what, but there are also negatives, can I say, because housing was a huge problem and still now a huge problem in Aviemore um, to accommodate workers. Um, but, John, could you really highlight the positives of areas like what's happened to Aviemore and towns and the investment that's went into it? Um, and there is negatives, and I'm going to come to them as well. Um, yes, certainly. I'm, I'm a regular visitor to the Cairngorms as well, so I know um, Aviemore and that area well. Um, I actually think it's looking a whole lot better than it did 30 or 40 years ago, in my opinion. And I wouldn't put that all down to the National Park Authority. Uh, some of it, yes. Uh, a lot of it to local businesses. Um, a lot of it to um, plans and projects which have been applied across the whole place. So I know there was a, um, there was a big project to re repair and extend dry stone dikes throughout the, the village uh, and also to improve the lighting and to improve the signage. Um, so, and the, the, another thing I'd highlight, and this applies in the other national park as well, is um, opportunities for path networks. So there's a lot better path networks in and around Aviemore and Canusi and Newton Moor, um, and certainly this is to the credit of the National Park Authority, and these are used by local people for walking their dogs, for walking their kids, for um, running fresh air and exercise, and they're also used by visitors, because some people come to the area and they want to, to go and do challenging technical climbing high up in the quarries and on the plateau. Others want to do much more low-level walks in the woods, in the forests, around the towns, around the villages that they're staying in. Uh, so I think you're right. I think there's been a, a lot of investment in the area. I think there's more still to come. Um, but the great thing about a national park is that it brings this additional focus to an area and it brings additional resources to an area. And that, that's money, uh, budget, but it's also staff who have uh, dedicated jobs to uh, look after the cultural heritage, to work with farmers in the area, to work with tourism businesses in the area, to work with food and drink businesses in the area. So there are all these people working away, trying to do their best uh, to support local businesses where those local businesses meet the aims of the National Park, which most of them do. So I, I think that's an important thing. And I think it, it, it came across a bit earlier on as well, but when we were talking about existing national parks, that national parks often focus on an area which has not hitherto been the focus of a local authority. Because understandably, local authorities uh, tend to focus mostly on the places where most of their constituents live, which tends to be in the towns and cities. So if you think of the Loch Lomond and Trossachs National Park, for example, um, there's Stirling Council, where most people live in Stirling. There's Argyll and Butte Council, where a lot of people live in Helensburgh and Loch Gilphead. Um, there's uh, Western Bartonshire Council as well. So the, the, the area of the National Park is, is slightly peripheral to, to each of those. And I think a National Park Authority helps to redress that balance. And it's been hinted at about Galloway as well. Um, this is, it is the Scottish Government's not proposing a Dumfries and Galloway National Park. It is proposing a Galloway National Park. And that's because it's the, the western part of Dumfries and Galloway. It's the historic Galloway part. Um, which would benefit from that support, from that additional investment, because it's a place where there is shortage of employment, uh, where wages are relatively low, where there are housing issues, and all of these things, are, it's possible that a national park can contribute to helping them. I, I hope I've moved from the general to the particular in a way you'd approve of. of. Yeah. 
John, my next question is aimed at, aimed at you as well. Nature Scott recommended in 2023 advice that there should be regular reviews by the government and stakeholders on the progress within national park partnership plans. How do, well do you think national parks are currently reviewing their progress or being externally scrutinised? Um, the, the national park plan is that it's the kind of central feature of a national park authority that, um, as Nick mentioned, the uh, National Park Authority often doesn't really bring any new powers or processes, so the forestry system is the same in a national park, the education system is the same, the farm support system is the same. There's a lot of things which don't change. Um, what the, the great power which the National Park Authority has is it's able to convene uh, wider groups to support its aims. And that's where the National Park Partnership Plan comes in. And with the partnership plan is a partnership of all of these other organisations, the um, local organisations and the local branches of the government agent, the relevant government agencies that are relevant to the aims of the park. And there's a, a lengthy process for preparing each partnership plan. There's a yet another consultation takes place uh, amidst. Uh, local people and local representative bodies, which ultimately results in the main themes of the plan going forward, and then the staff prepare that plan. And then the important bit happens, which is they start implementing it. So if, for example, it's identified that deer management is a crucial issue, then there's a five-year programme comes out of that to uh, improve deer management arrangements. If affordable housing is identified, as it always is, as a, a key issue in rural areas, then there is a programme which comes out of that, which is what can the National Park Authority do uh, to encourage the provision of more affordable housing. It can't do it itself, but it can certainly encourage housing associations, local authorities, private businesses to work together towards that. So that's the way the process works. I think it's a good process because it, it happens every five years. The, the plan goes up. Most of the time is spent implementing the plan by the National Park Authority itself and also by all of its, very part, uh, all of its various partners. Um, and then towards the end of that period, everybody comes back together again to review how it's gone. And there is always a review carried out as to what has been implemented and what the problems were, what the challenges were with the previous partnership plan before the next one starts being prepared. So I think, I think that's a good process, and it's resulted in uh, quite a bit of good successes and progress within the two existing national parks. John, um, the key drivers for designating more national parks is climate and nature crisis. How important are national parks as a mechanism for tackling climate and nature crisis? Uh, again, I'm going to agree with Nick Kemp that you heard from earlier on. I'm not convinced that we need to specifically say uh, we need to that national parks have a role in tackling the climate and nature crises because that's all you could say that's already built into their existing aims. Um, however, I don't have any problem with that because these crises are real and they are upon us and all governments and all citizens and all agencies need to work together to tackle both of those things. And if that means that uh, the national park authorities are being given additional duties, then that's still heading in the right direction. It's been quite clear for several years that ministers have issued clear instructions to national park authorities that they should be leaders in this respect and that they should be thinking very hard about anything that they can possibly do to tackle the climate emergency in their own operations and in their own areas, uh, and also to uh, re help to reverse the nature crisis. So I think it's, uh, I think it's welcome. I, I don't think it's strictly necessary. Uh, we, we shall see. I think the other point that I'd make, which I think again was mentioned earlier this morning, is about timing, and that's my understanding is that if a new national park were to be designated in Galloway in 2026, that might be before the Natural Environment Bill has been discussed and passed and implemented. So it's possible, uh, my, well, my assumption is that any new national park designated in the next year and a bit would be under the existing National Parks Act as it stands, and it may be that that subsequently is amended by the Natural Environment Bill, depending on the parliamentary process of that. So I, I don't have an answer to that, but I hope I've framed the, the issue correctly and that we're not quite sure what the, uh, what the timing will be, what the sequence of events will be between, between those various occurrences. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm slightly conscious of time, just mention that in passing. Um, we're moving to the third theme now, which is engagement process and local buy-in, and uh, Mr Golden. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, welcome, panel. Um, I'm quite interested in the, the public con consultation, indeed, if you like, the definition or the proposal, because I think what we see, whether it's local authorities, Scottish Government or indeed uh, non-departmental public bodies in their consultation, um, it's often quite difficult to understand exactly what the proposal is and what it means. So I just, I know the formal consultations to start, but from your assessment, are Nature Scott able to say, for example, we know that Loch Lomond and Tro uh, Trossachs has Loch Lomond Shores, Cairngorms has Avi Moore. This is the version of that in Galloway. That will mean economic benefits, tourism benefits. However, these are the downsides in terms of house prices or congestion, or actually there's going to be a commitment from the Scottish Government to upgrade the A75. So actually, as a result of this, it'll be, you know, is that vision able to be presented, you know, over the next couple of weeks and, and throughout the consultation process? I think there's been a long conversation that has gone on. Um, I've mentioned the, uh, the, the meetings that have taken place with um, Galloway National Park Association and uh, over the last um, seven years, eight years that we've been working on this. Um, I think the, there has been a lot of material in the local press. Um, I, my file has over 100 things in, and uh, that suggests there'll be more that I haven't seen, and that doesn't include all the TV and radio uh, features that have been on it. So I think um, the idea that uh, there has been... Uh, no, nobody knows about this, I think, is a little disingenuous. Um, I think the, uh, the process for the first five years was actually to convince Scottish Government that we thought we should have more national parks and that Galloway should be one, obviously, but actually there was no commitment until the, this current uh, programme of government, uh, which we were delighted to see that commitment. Um, I think the, the process of... Uh, I guess people want... Two things that we've heard lots of problems about things which are nothing to do with national parks. Most of the conversation, Loch Arbour is not a national park, and uh, Loch Arbour, as far as it stands, is not proposed to be a national park. Um, but those kind of things exist, and so those colour the kind of conversation. Uh, I think it is not easy um, because if you just present the this is what it is precisely, then you are equally criticised for closing down the debate and saying uh, this is the final solution, and that's clearly not the case. Uh, we very much see that um, this is a proposal, and the question is, uh, will Galloway go forward? And if it does, on what basis would it go forward? And I think those are both valid questions, and I think uh, in any um, conversations we've had, that's kind of the impression we've had. Um, that uh, both those questions are, are still very much up in the air. So, I mean, just for clarity, um, because national parks, in terms of meeting their statutory obligations, could actually vary quite considerably in terms of what they look like. But um, in terms of, is a, if you like, a tourism hub foreseen? as part of that, something similar to your Avi Moors and Loch Lomond Shores, or is, is that not part of the vision? Or is, you, you know, because otherwise, how can, they, how can the public and local communities make an assessment over whether they want something if they don't know what it looks like? Yeah, I think it's kind of the other way around, isn't it? I mean, tourism hubs appear. I don't think national parks create them. National parks try and manage them. Um, in Galloway, we don't really have tourism hubs because we don't have that number of tourists um, you know we're, we're quite a large area we don't know if it goes forward what that area the size of that area will finally be uh, 
but obviously there are attractions in the areas in the hills, in the forest park and on the coasts. Um, so so there, are, there are kind of areas where people currently go to, but I wouldn't say we have obvious um, tourism hubs. They, I think the, the strength we have in, in Galloway is this is not being driven by a need to address a major problem of over-tourism and how you deal with it. This is actually being driven by a desire to develop the four strands of the National Park as part of a sustainable economy for Galloway, of which a National Park is part of, and a very important part of. We, and we also have important forestry, we also have important farming, we also have uh, wind farms in some of the area. Um, the, there has been a lot of investment gone into those those three that I've just mentioned there, but over the last decade, uh, Galloway has got poorer. So despite all that investment in those sectors and that development, we've actually gone backwards. We've continued to get poorer. Um, and uh, by comparison, um, the farming uh, numbers are falling, people involved in agriculture are falling. Um, a report, um, the workforce uh, employment data for English national parks, which have obviously been established uh, longer, but this happened to be 2009 to 2021, um, which is when they went over to commercial holdings. They've seen a growth in employment in farms in national parks. So that suggests a slightly different model or a variety of models, because of course agriculture is very diverse and to lump it in and just say there is one sort of farmer is, is, is disingenuous. Okay, uh, thanks for that. I, I think the issue I'm having is around this response to local community demand and actually without having, it doesn't need to be a, a, an exact blueprint, but if you like a vision or an indication of, of, of what it might look like. And John, obviously you take a wider view around national parks. Um, you More generally, could you see quite a different blueprint for a national park that differs from the two existing ones we have? Or do you think that's naturally where, you know, broadly where it would lead to? And specifically around uh, Galloway, I, I guess, what's your input in terms of what that might look like and also how that might be presented to local communities to allow them to make an assessment on whether they want it or not? Um, the, the simple answer is yes, I think it could be different, but the way in which it could be different is through the governance arrangements, through the powers and functions which it's given, and through the, the size, the boundary, the area, what it includes. And, and these are precisely the things which Nature Scott's being asked to report on. I, I think that those are the main things it's being asked for, uh, the name, the governance arrangements, in other words, how big is the authority going to be and who's it made up of, um, the powers and functions which it should or shouldn't have and what the boundary should be. So we move from the lots of different things are on the table to we are consulting on a particular proposal or set of proposals. I think going beyond that, the sort of thing you mentioned, which was major tourism developments or specific road repair, road um, improvements, for example, I think that's not the sort of thing which will be discussed in this phase. That's very much up to the National Park Authority once it's uh, set up and running, and that's the sort of thing which would emerge from the na first National Park Partnership Plan, not just the National Park Authority, but all the other relevant local organisations coming together to say these are the top priorities for the area. And that, that's part of the advantage of the National Park Authority, is that it isn't the Scottish Government or Nature Scott saying this is what's going to happen in your area, it's setting up a structure which allows people in that area to set their priorities. And I'd, I'd remind the committee, maybe you're all aware of this, but, but there, there is an inbuilt, in the National Parks Act, there is an inbuilt 
local majority on the National Park Authority. So 40% uh, of the people on it are locally elected councillors and 20% of the people on it are directly elected local people. So you could say it's um, local people being charged with the disbursement of natural, national resources. So it's 100% funded by the Scottish Government, but it is ultimately controlled by a majority of, of local people. I think that's an important thing to understand the way the, the thing was set up and the way it's been working. Um, but the size of the the overall size of the National Park Authority and exactly you know, which, uh, which local authorities uh, have how many councillors. That, that's, that's a matter of detail which would, would come through the, the report. So I hope that's got some way to answering your, your question. It almost strikes me that what would be beneficial is for the Scottish Government via Nature Scott to, to come up with a vision that provides the detail of the Galloway National Park that allows then communities to make a decision because it, it sounds to me as if communities are being asked to sign a blank check on something that they really don't know how it's going to impact on them and actually the you know the concept of national parks could be quite different for different people and therefore the assessment on whether they support it or not could be quite radically different and it seems to me the consultation process as envisaged isn't going to allow local communities to, to come to a conclusion on, on, on any of this and actually in some ways asking for local community demand for something they don't know what it is is actually an impossible task and I don't know if you've got some, some thoughts on how to square that circle. Briefly. Sorry. <laughs> I suppose in one sentence, I understand and have sympathy with, with what you're saying, but would encourage everybody to get involved as much as they possibly can once the consultation's out and make exactly those, those sort of points, because that's the opportunity which is forthcoming. I think it is an iterative process, isn't it? You, it's getting people's views. The stakeholder phase, which has actually become quite a public phase, but actually the stakeholder phase was... Uh, to gather information to help the reporter to shape what comes in the public consultation phase. The public consultation phase will shape the kind of report that um, is produced by Nature Scott. If the minister is minded to proceed, then there is another round of consultation if there is a if there are draft designation orders. So uh, I think um, it's kind of like we want all the information, but we want to be able to input our own views into that information. So it's kind of a, you know, you, you're kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't, I think, in some of these circumstances with this kind of consultation. You've got, you've got to provide some information. People will respond to that. You then respond and produce a, 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 a different version or whatever it is. So I think we are in a process and an important process that starts uh, in the public sense in the next couple of weeks. Move to the fourth theme, which is forthcoming legislation on national parks and potential national park statement, including implications of pursuing reform and designation on a twin track. And Mr Chowdhury. Thank you, Convener. Uh, the Scottish Government has proposed to make changes to national parks legislation in a bill due to come later in this parliamentary year. Have you engaged with this consultation and were you able to take into account the proposal in the development of the nomination you are involved in? Yes, we did. We, we've, uh, with our partners at APRS, we've been involved in all of the various stages uh, of the, from the decision to proceed with the next National Park, which was three years ago, uh, through all the various Nature Scott and Scottish Government consultations, of, of which that's one. So we've participated in it and we're aware of it. And I think I wouldn't really want to add much to uh, what we said, what I said earlier, which is that um, any uh, any legislative change coming up through the Natural Environment Bill which affects the National Parks Act if, as I understand, it's uh, simply emphasising the potential leadership role of national park authorities in tackling the climate emergency and the nature crisis. Um, I, I don't have any problem with that. I, don't, I think that can only be beneficial. Um, I don't think it was strictly necessary because you could argue that the existing National Parks Act uh, covers those issues in, in its existing aims. Um, but w I, I certainly... Um, would welcome 
uh, those changes because they're, they're meant with good intent and they're, they're intended to be wholly positive. Um, and national park authorities have been taking action on climate issues and on nature issues, and I'm sure they'll be happy to carry on doing so. So being given that additional focus, um, to some extent, just reinforces what's already been happening. I think at the, uh, at the local level, um, like all the um, individual um, bid areas, we weren't involved in the national stakeholder consultation, so obviously uh, we have seen the kind of things uh, that uh, have come forward. Um, I think um, there's some updating of wording. There's some areas that I think um, we will be keen to press to make sure that we retain a strong local governance uh, element in the National Park. Um, I think uh, the process is, uh, as ever, um, you ha we have what we're faced with. I mean, that's, that's the situation, and, um, and uh, we think uh, the National Park Act and what is proposed is not fundamentally uh, changing the nature of the Act as it stands, which was a well-worded Act. It was written to be flexible enough. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, that's the situation we're in at the moment. When I asked the previous panel uh, if they were aware, but uh, a lot of them said that they were not aware, and the government, uh, how can the government get them involved? Uh, I think it's difficult if you're a um, local person in one of these areas going about your own business to be aware of all the national uh, discussions, consultations, proposal, legislative arrangements which are going on in every aspect that, that might affect you. I entirely understand that's a, a challenge. I, I've spent my life working in um, landscape policy and town and country planning policy, and so I've, you know, I have an understanding of those. But I, I'm, I have no knowledge or expertise in health policy or education policy or foreign policy or you know all of the other things which, uh, which the government and parliament get involved in. Um, so it's it's not easy, uh, and I, I, I think it, you can't expect ordinary citizens from across the country to be able to engage with. Um, every possible high-level consultation which is going on. But, you know, now this one matters because it's not just uh, general, it's specific. It's about a particular area. And so I think it's very important that everybody locally is uh, uh, encouraged to be brought up to speed as quickly as they can and that they're given the information that they need to be able to judge whether they're in favour or not. Uh, Nature Scott also made other recommendations to improve how national parks are run. For example, that there should be more involvement of communities and different sectors in developing national park plans, and that funding streams should be available to deliver the plans. What are your views on those suggestions? Those both sound like very positive and sensible suggestions, which I would fully support. And likewise, and I think you can see that in action if you look at what happened with the um, Cairngorm Partnership Plan, the last version of it, um, that in the community section, uh, affordable housing and access to housing was just one on a list of uh, quite a long list of things to deal with. And as a result of the consultation, it came to the top of that list and very strongly with not only a, um, some very strong recommendations about how how it's going to deal with it, but also some potential actions it can do as well. Last question for me. Uh, are there any further changes you'd like to see how national parks are governed or supported uh, that would help to maximise benefits or that you think could help to resolve concerns of stakeholders about the designation of new areas? Um, I'm going to say two slightly conflicting things. One is that I think the National Park Authority Board should be as small as possible, but I also think that the balance between local and national representation on that board should be maintained. I think it's a good principle that there's a local majority uh, so that the really big decisions which the Park Authority has to take um, are taken by a majority of, lo of locally elected people. Um, but the, in the early days of the National Park Authorities, I think both the boards were too large and too unwieldy. And I think that's one of the lessons that we can learn from the uh, existing national parks to try to make the board as small as possible um, consistent with that 
principle of local majority. Yeah, I would, I would endorse that. I think um, um, I'm comfortable that uh, a, a national park doesn't need a huge amount of powers because actually that's not fundamentally how it works. It works by bringing people together and. Um, if somebody wants to stay outside the, uh, what the park is trying to achieve, um, then there's very little the National Park um, will do about that because it has no powers to do anything about that. I think that's important, you know, if, um, if our, um, some of our farmers want to carry on in uh, farming exactly as they do now or indeed developing their farming, which I have no problems with, then um, that's covered by what happens with the agriculture subsidies and the, the a whole different set of rules, which I don't think it's necessary for the um, the National Park to control everything. The National Park is about bringing people together, working for a common vision, and I think that's what we're aiming for. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Carter, we're quite tight for time, but I think I can allow you a question if you can pull together your thoughts into a kind of concise way. Thank you, thank you, Convener. I, firstly, uh, I'd, I'd like to put on record as, as a proud Galavidian of the nicest, most beautiful constituency in Scotland, so we can dispute that. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I, I've got to put on, on record that I was a supporter of uh, Galloway Park Light. Uh, I followed in the footsteps of my late a well-respected a, a former presiding officer, Sir Alec Ferguson, who saw the opportunities that a National Park light a process could bring to Galloway, an area which is seeing depopulation, an ageing population, one of the lowest wage economies in the country, uh, and houses being unaffordable, even though they're the lowest house prices currently in the, uh, around. But my question is around whether we're getting this process right. My, my support uh, of the National Park was somewhat uh, dented uh, and by the Greens. I think this whole process has been tainted by the influence that the Green parties had on this and the timetable that they brought in. So we, we already know but the very nature of Galloway, any na National Park would have to be hugely different. We've got a bigger population, we've got intensive agriculture, um, we've got a uh, population dispersed across the region with uh, commercial forestry, we've got renewables, quite unlike any of the other existing national parks, not just in Scotland, but across the United Kingdom. So it would have to be fundamentally different. Given that, I've, I've already called for a, a, an extension in the, the consultation, uh, and the Cabinet Secretary has stated that it needs to be done properly rather than to a timetable. And I'm sure you gentlemen want to see a national park deliver all the right things for Galloway that we need. So why why is it that you are uh, intent on seeing the current timetable progress, which may only lead to 12 weeks consultation uh, and a designation sometime before 2026, where everybody, if we do have a national park, and that may not be the solution, there could be other policy interventions which could deliver the benefits that everybody needs to see without designation. But why aren't you suggesting that we do the review of current national parks? Uh, and, and why uh, do we not ensure that the, the two processes which are run concurrently, the one to look at uh, potentially changing the priorities of a national park to more di biodiversity and climate change, rather than, in my view, it should be about sustainable economic development. Why can't we, we look at a process that delivers something that Galloway really needs, rather than sticking to a timetable that I think, in, in, in my opinion, is far too short? Do you want to go first? Or yep. go first? Uh, I mean, I think um, there has been a lot of discussion already. I think. Um, a lot depends on the kind of information we get at the next stage as to how that moves us, moves us forward. Um, clearly, um, the, it's important for those who are as yet undecided in how to move forward. Those who are firmly for and those who are firmly against, I suspect that much of what comes next is, is pretty much will reinforce whatever views they have. And that's fine. Uh, it's the undecided people who I think need to be able to get the information they need and to find out the kind of uh, things we're looking forward to. I think the, there is no doubt Galloway will be different. We have a biosphere. There's 
real potential to to work constructively between a national park and a biosphere. A biosphere on its own can't deliver what we need, but it can deliver something uh, better than just a national park on its own, which I think is important because it extends the reach. Um, I think it is important that the process goes on unless you know we're all going to sit around the table here and make commitments into the next parliament for um, uh, a national park. You're very aware that um, things have to run on parliamentary cycles and um, it would be naive to think otherwise. Um, that's part of my concern as well, which is that the reason we are where we are is because over many years, I and others spent a lot of time talking to um, individual MSPs and also to political parties and gradually persuaded them to include a commitment to a uh, new national park in their manifestos. So we are now sitting um, in a parliament which started in 2021 where uh, f uh, four of the parties uh, had commitments to a new national park and where the Scottish Government itself then decided in 2021 that it was going to go ahead uh, with the new national park and that's in the programme for government from last year as well. Uh, I suppose it's a, it's a general point about public policy. I think it's important that um, political parties and government should be seen to do what they said they were going to do. And so there are the, uh, I think, manifesto commitments should be honoured and implemented. Um, and I think the programme for government should be honoured and implemented by 2026. And I as I said earlier on, I think there's been an extremely thorough, some might even say too thorough, process to get us to this point. I think it's given every possible opportunity uh, for debate of all of the issues, and I think the timetable is quite tight to deliver on those manifesto commitments and uh, the programme for government commitment, so I think we should continue with the existing timetable. I, I, just, I think it's important to put on record that the manifesto commitments made by some parties were based on what was there previously, not on what the Butte House Agreement ultimately delivered, and that was a national park um, based on biodiversity and climate change as a priority. And that's certainly not, I can say, that's not the manifesto commitment that certainly the Scottish Conservatives put forward, and that commitment was to sustainable economic development. So uh, we've got to be very careful ensuring that manifesto committees are, uh, are, are recognised for what they were, uh, and that was changed when the, the Greens uh, entered the Butte House Agreement. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I mean, I was already struck by the fierce note of controversy Mr Mayhew introduced by suggesting governments do what they said they were going to. <laughs> uh, but uh, can I thank both uh, Mr Lucas and Mr Mayhew for your evidence this morning. It was very much appreciated and has helped us in our consideration and development of the petition. Uh, we will be hearing from our friends at Nature Scott, after all I said, uh, at our next meeting. Uh, so I hope they've been listening carefully to our deliberations today. Uh, and following that, we'll be hearing from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and the Islands. Uh, members, are you content that we uh, consider the petition at a future meeting after we've heard the opportunity to hear from both Nature Scott and from the Cabinet Secretary? We are. We are slightly behind time, so I'm going to suspend very briefly, but ask those who are departing if they are to do so quietly and for us to change the scenery and personnel very quickly so that we can proceed without much delay. Brief suspension. Welcome back, and we now continue with our consideration of uh, continuing petitions with petition number 1610 to upgrade the A75 and petition number 1657, the A77 upgrade. Uh, these call on the Scottish Parliament to uh, urge the Scottish Government to upgrade the A75 
euro unit route to dual carriageway for its entirety as soon as possible. And the 1657 petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to dual the A77 from Ayr Whitlitz roundabout south to the two ferry ports located at Cairn Ryan, including the point at which the A77 connects with the A75. Um, we are joined this morning by our colleague uh, Brian Whittle, MSP. Welcome, Brian. I think Mr Carson's sitting in for us in relation to this petition as well. We last considered this petition uh, in December last uh, when we heard... Uh, that prioritisation of the Strategic Transport Projects Review 2 recommendations would feed into a delivery plan. That delivery plan was due to be published in late 23, and colleagues may recall that we requested an update on when it would be published. The then Minister for Transport and now Cabinet Secretary for Transport, Fiona Hislops, responded to the committee in late January. 24. The response noted that this is a complex piece of work with consultation ongoing across the Scottish Government, but did not give an indication on when the delivery plan would be published. The Scottish Government at that time had a commitment from the previous UK Government to provide multi-year funding of £8 million for improvements on the A75. Uh, the petitioner for 1657, Donald McHarry, provided a submission which highlights developments since we did last consider the position last year, and he states that a summit was held on this issue, with the key message focusing on the need for investment in the A77 and the A75 in order to provide economic benefits and to reduce CO2 emissions on the roads. He calls for the improvement of the A77 to be raised to national status and to, be not, to not be considered as just an issue for the south-west of Scotland. Now, we've also received a written submission this morning from our colleague Elena Whittam. Uh, she is unable to attend the meeting, and her submission reiterates her support for Petition 1657 and emphasises that the A77 and A75 are vital strategic routes for Ayrshire and Scotland, supporting both communities and businesses and therefore, before we move to members, uh, can I ask Mr Whittle if he has anything he would like to contribute further to our consideration? Mr Whittle. Thank you very much, Convener, and I really do appreciate uh, another uh, uh, opportunity to, uh, uh, to support the, the uh, petitions. I know I've been here several times before. Um, I, uh, what I did I tried to look at some, something different to say today than I have said before, um, and I had a wee look at the A77 specifically, because that's uh, my region. I know Mr Carson will speak to 75. I looked at um, the A77 trunk road and how many times it has been closed with diversions in place. I mean, I say those diversions uh, take it um, uh, around a B road that's um, difficult for two cars to pass, let alone a convoy of 44-tonne trucks, which, uh, having spoken to and one of the uh, the haulage companies, every time there is a diversion onto that B road, there is damage to, the, to their trucks. And uh, certainly a few of them have been tipped into the field trying to pass each other. But I looked at the number of times between January uh, 2023 and uh, September this year, how many times that road had been closed with that diversion. And that is a total of 214 times during that period. I think, you know... I don't know how else we can we can frame this. That that has got to be, you know, given that it's a trunk road, given that it is a, an arterial route that uh, to the the third busiest port in in the UK at Cairn Ryan, and given that 45% of goods coming in and out of uh, uh, Ireland, Northern Ireland, come through that 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 port, it, is, it can't be seen as anything other than a very important arterial route, um, and. As I said, the, the, if, you, if you drove down that route, uh, especially at certain times of the day, uh, it would probably give you, a, a, well, it would definitely give you a, an indication of why uh, this is such a pressing, uh, pressing issue. Um, and, and what's more, there's actually evidence, you can actually evidence what happens when uh, uh, action is taken, because we have now got the, the bypass at Maybole, and the huge impact that has had on the town of Maybole and the huge impact that has had on, on the time it takes uh, to, 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 to get down, down that route is evidence, is evidence enough. And if we were at least able to do things like bypass government, which is a massive um, um, hold-up in traffic, um, um, I mean, that, the, the, these convoys of trucks go straight through the centre 
of, of Mabel. Um, and uh, I ha having had the opportunity to go down in a 44-ton truck, it's, it's, well, it's not something I would advise, to be quite honest, but, but it's certainly illuminating. And as you've indicated, uh, Convener, STPR2 was supposed to have delivered a plan, uh, and that STPR2 has been, for the, as long as I can remember in this Parliament, it has been, has been going on. And each time it gets watered down and watered down, I fully expect the next one to say that they'll cut the grass verges you know, every second year or something, the way this is going. Th this has to be done. And, for, and, and if I said that the, the cost of the Mabel bypass was £30 million, uh, and I know that's a lot of money, but comparative uh, to a, a Scottish budget where the south west of Scotland has transport uh, budget has been something like 0.4% of the budget has been spent in, in, in the southwest of Scotland in the last 10 years. We are definitely not looking for special treatment, but we'd like a little bit of parity and a little bit of understanding. Um, uh, I was interested in the, 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 uh, the, the, the last uh, uh, petition you heard there around the, the, impact, the, the, the economic um, issues that uh, the South West of Scotland face. So I would, I would, as I said, I would, I would ask the the, uh, the, petition, uh, the the petitions committee that we need to get some answers on this. This has been going on f for as long as I've been in this Parliament, and this issue has been asked for as long as I've been in this Parliament, and it just keeps getting the can keeps getting kicked down the road, and the solution keeps getting watered down and watered down and watered down by the government, and we have absolute evidence as to why it is imperative that the 77 get this get uh, it gets the the treatment it deserves thank you thank very you. much mr Whitman. mr carson uh, um, so a bit like uh, brian well i don't want to re, uh, repeat a lot of what was said but let me begin with the late alex salmon who in november 2011 13 years ago spoke at the opening of the new ports at cairn ryan and talked about the three r's uh, of Scottish Government support for the region, that was roads, rail and uh, regeneration. Um, the the first, then First Minister even announced the creation of a Scottish Government task force to work with local councils and other partners to explore the potential for the future of Sunrar. Sadly, it all fizzled out, fizzled out like uh, many other promises. Um, and from the First Minister, John Sweeney, who pledged uh, to improve journey times on the road back in 2016, He's been followed by a succession of transport ministers, uh, Hamza Youssef, Jenny de Ruth, Michael Matheson, Kevin Stewart, Mary McCallan, Graham Day and the current Transport Secretary, Fiona Hislop, who have all pledged action to upgrade uh, this key artery uh, between the UK and Europe. Um, so now, eight years on since petition PE1610 uh, to upgrade A75 was first lodged, we're still waiting for action. Uh, the route was recognised uh, in the Sir Peter Hendy uh, Union Connectivity Review as one of the most financially beneficial roads in the UK, carrying billions of pounds worth of goods every year. Um, talks are now, thankfully, finally uh, being uh, held between respective governments uh, in the UK and, Sc and Scotland. But uh, and hopefully today we'll, we'll find out whether the, the, the UK Labour government are following on the commitment to, to fund uh, uh, some studies on the A75 and follow that up with uh, uh, funding uh, to, to actually develop upgrades. Um, the, the, chronically, the chronic failure to invest in the A75 uh, is shown tragically in the number of human lives we've lost, uh, and the safety record of the road is quite appalling. Uh, Brian Whittle touched on the, the closure on the A75 and to give you some, uh, on the A77. To give you some examples, uh, between January of this year and September, the A75 was closed on nine occasions due to uh, serious road traffic accidents. Uh, and for the same date range, the, the road was closed with diversions in place on 11 occasions uh, of the, re the result of roadworks or storm damage. And, and these uh, diversions result in uh, hundreds of miles detours on roads that are not fit to carry the, the, the traffic. Um, even scheduled closures now are overnight. And the reason they have to be overnight closures or, or full closures of the road is because the, the, the trunk road is not wide enough to allow uh, upgrades uh, on the, the surface to be made and traffic to safely pass by. So it's a bit of a double whammy. Um, you know, it is now clear that uh, we need to stop talking about this and, and get action to upgrade uh, the A75, which is, as I say, being identified as one of the most important uh, roads in the whole of the UK, and it needs to be done as a matter of urgency. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Carson. Well, I mean, uh, we were expecting an update nearly a year ago. Um, that's not been forthcoming. 
Uh, I think Mr Torrance has got some suggestions to make. Mr Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if the committee would consider writing to a Cabinet Secretary for Transport, note the delay in the publication of Strategic Transport Projects Review to Delivery Plan and ask when it will be published, and also to write and ask whether the new UK Government has reaffirmed its commitment to provide multi-year funding to improve the A75. The point just made by Mr Carson, yes. in fact, in his submission. Uh, so, yes, it seems like an extraordinarily long time uh, for a delay and nothing to be forthcoming. I mean, it, it, you know, I think that seems entirely reasonable. Our colleagues content that we keep the petition open and we pursue these two suggestions uh, and try and get some definition as to what's happening. We are. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We move to petition number 1876 to accurately record the sex of people charged or convicted of rape or attempted rape lodged by Lucy Hunter, Blackburn, Lisa Mackenzie and Kath Murray, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to require Police Scotland, the Crown Office and the Scottish Court Service to accurately record the sex of people charged or convicted of rape or attempted rape. Uh, we've been joined this morning by our colleague Tess White, former member of this committee, uh, who has been following the progress of this petition. Good morning, Tess. Morning. Uh, we last... Uh, is it still in fact? No, just good afternoon, Tess, as it turns out, by uh, six-tenths of a second. We have been, uh, so we last considered this petition at our meeting on the 24th of January 2024, uh, when we agreed then to write to Police Scotland. We've now received a response from Police Scotland, which states that it requires no evidence or certification as proof of biological sex or gender identity other than a person's self-declaration unless it is pertinent to any investigation with which they are linked as a victim, witness or accused, and it is evidentially critical that the police legally require this proof. We have also received a submission from the petitioners, reflecting on all the responses we have received from Police Scotland over the course of this petition's consideration. Their submission also highlights the media coverage generated by Police Scotland's most recent response and the subsequent comments that have been made by Chief Constable and Deputy Chief Constable, including in correspondence with the Criminal Justice Committee. Now, our colleague Michelle Thompson, who is unable to join us today, has, however, provided a written submission in support of the petition and sharing her view on the lack of clarity being offered by Police Scotland on the operation detail of their policies. And again, before I invite the committee to consider how we might proceed, I wonder if Tess White would like to contribute to our deliberations. Thank you, convener. Thank you also to the committee for the opportunity to make a brief uh, remark about this petition on Police Scotland's controversial policy on recording the sex of offenders. Until recently, this was based on self-ID, and there has understandably been growing public interest, as the convener has said today, in this petition, not least from my constituents in the North East. And that's testament to the tenaciousness and determination of the petitioners Lucy Hunter-Blackburn, Lisa McKenzie and Kath Murray from Policy Collective Murray Blackburn McKenzie. In September, it shockingly emerged that Police Scotland had justified its data recording policy because it adhered to the forces, and I quote, values of respect, integrity, fairness and human rights whilst promoting a strong sense of belonging. In other words, Police Scotland was prioritising the feelings of sex offenders over the victims of sexual crime, and to do so was absolutely indefensible. Rape is defined in law as involving penetration by a penis without consent and is therefore, by definition, the act of a male body. That is why this matters. As MBM's submission highlights, Police Scotland appears to have publicly U-turned on this policy, and that is to be welcomed. But questions remain about the application of this policy in the past and the detail of how Police Scotland will implement this operational change in future. And since this petition was lodged in June 2021, which is a considerable time ago, the committee has corresponded with Police Scotland on several occasions, and thank you for that. My view, committee, is that to get to the bottom of the force's operational policies on data recording, Police Scotland must urgently be invited by this committee to give oral evidence. And I'm just imploring the committee, please don't close this petition down. The Scottish Government has already washed its hands of the issue, and I urge the committee 
to listen to the voices of women and give this matter the seriousness it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr Chowdhury. I think there's a very powerful st statement by Tess White, and I, I think we should invite um, Chief Constable or Police Scotland to give evidence in future uh, meetings and keep the uh, petition open. Thank you. Mr Chowdhury, I think, uh, has suggested something that I think will find an echo with colleagues, that we invite Police Scotland to come to this committee and to give evidence in relation to this matter at a future meeting. Are colleagues content that we do that? Agreed. We are. Then we will keep the petition open and we will look forward to hearing from Police Scotland in due course. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We move then to petition number 1988 to review the process for disposal of household raw sewage uh, lodged by Sue Wallace, urging the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to review the process for allowing raw sewage discharge from homes into Scottish coastal waters to provide additional funding to SEPA for enforcement to introduce legislation to ban households from discharging raw sewage. We last considered this petition in December last when we agreed to write to the Scottish Government. Its response to the committee reiterates SEPA's approach to regulation. The submission highlights two consultations, the first of which relates to proposals for an integrated environmental authorisation framework. The second consultation sought views on the regulation of private wastewater treatment systems to protect the environment. The petitioner's written submission states that the Scottish Government's response provides a circular argument and does not provide more insight on regulation as requested by the committee. She notes SEPA's requirement to contribute to improving the health and well-being of people in Scotland and argues that the responses to the petition from both SEPA and the Scottish Government have not addressed this point. The petitioner states that all responses and strategies have focused entirely on environmental issues to the exclusion of other linked duties. Do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Mr Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if the committee would consider writing to the Scottish Government to ask whether it intends to take any action in relation to private wastewater systems in response to water, wastewater and drainage policy consultation findings, and whether it recognises that prioritising its enforcement activity on incidents that have the greatest environment impact or involve significant non-compliance, SEPA is not addressing the actions that fall under its threshold but still have a significant impact on people's quality of life. Mr Torrance has made a couple of suggestions. We keep the petition open and are we agreed to pursue? We are. Thank you. <laughs> petition number 18, uh, 1989 uh, to increase defibrillators in public spaces and workplaces. This has been lodged by Mary Montague, who I should say is known to me as the constituency member for Eastwood as the provost of my local authority of East Renfrewshire. Uh, the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to support the provision of defibrillators in public spaces and workplaces, and we last considered this petition in December last. We have received a response from the then Minister for Public Health and Women's Health, Mary Todd. The response states that the purchase of defibrillators is mainly through fundraising in the community or funded by businesses or organisations. It also states that the Scottish Government is working alongside the Resuscitation Research Group at the University of Edinburgh to better understand the evidence around the placement of defibrillators in Scotland and to develop a tool which would help defibrillator guardians make informed decisions about where best to place their device in order to that could have the most impact. That sounds a bit gobbledygook, but anyhow. The committee had asked whether the Scottish Government would consider making representations to the UK Government to update the health and safety at work legislation to include defibrillator provision as part of the minimum first aid requirements. The then Minister's response states that it is a reserve policy area. It would be the responsibility of the UK Government to consider this and that the Scottish Government's priority is its collective partnership approach. And I think in considering this position, uh, petition, colleagues, uh, we will have in mind that we recently asked the Minister whether the Scottish Government will provide direct funding for primary and secondary schools to purchase and install defibrillators for petition number 2101. Uh, and the Minister's response again reiterated that it was for local authorities to make decisions in purchasing, installing and maintaining defibrillators for schools. So I, I think the committee has been quite have charged on the aims behind this campaign for defibrillators and a bit underwhelmed by the response. Um, do the committee colleagues have any suggestions for action as to how we might proceed? Mr Torrance? Thank you, Convener. This is something I've personally um, 
have an interest in as somebody who has had somebody's life saved by a defibrillator is really close to my heart. I know how important it is for him to have easy access for the public uh, to get to him. So I wonder if a committee would consider writing to the Minister for Public Health and Women's Health to ask whether she is confident that relying on community fundraising, businesses and organisations' resources to purchase defibrillators will ensure that the Scottish Government meets the two 2026 targets in the out-of-hospital cardiac arrest strategy well, that 20% of all cardiac arrests will have a defibrillator applied before the ambulance services arrive, and survival from OHCA will increase to 15%. I wonder if the committee would also consider asking what the rationale is for not encouraging engaging with the UK Government on the issue of defibrillator provision through the Health and Safety Act at Work um, 1947 Act. A colleague's content? I mean, I wonder, colleagues, if you would also be content for us to frame this using a little, a slightly stronger language, that the committee are concerned at what appears to be growing evidence of a lack of urgency behind the uh, will to take forward these issues. And given that we all support a preventative health agenda, the provision of defibrillators is something that not only saves lives, but potentially uh, it, through preventing subsequent um, need for hospital admission and other, and other interventions, you know, is, is a preventative measure that we should be encouraging. It, it, it just seems, together with the petition we heard in relation to schools, where Scotland seems to be lagging significantly behind the rest of the United Kingdom, that, that for whatever reason, there just isn't the impetus being put into this programme here in Scotland. And if we could frame our questions around that, are members content to do so? Yes. Oh, thank you. That brings us to petition number 1993 to reform the financial support for social work students on work placements. Uh, this has been lodged by David Grimm and Lucy Challoner, and the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to ensure social work students have access to adequate financial support during their studies by, one, providing bursaries to all third and fourth year undergraduate social work students on work placements, and secondly, to reform the assessment, assessment criteria and adequately fund the bursaries for postgraduate social work students at work placements. Again, we considered this last on the 20th of December, where we agreed to write to the Scottish Social Services Council and the Minister for Higher and Further Education. The Minister's response to the committee highlights that from this academic year, postgraduate students not eligible to receive bursary support from the Scottish Social Services Council will be able to apply for the postgraduate funding package administered by the Student Awards Agency Scotland, the SAAS. The response also highlights the Scottish Social Service Council's new model and schedule of rates for the financial support it provides to postgraduate students. It's also worked to increase clarity for students on the funding they would receive if they are eligible for a bursary, reduce the complexity of assessments and streamline the administrative processes. The, the Social Ed Work Education Partnership, SWEP, uh, commissioned a review of practice learning funding, which reported in September 23, and the Minister's written submission states that the recommendations are being considered by the Scottish Government. The Scottish Social Service Council's written submission states that an action plan is being drafted by the SWEP programme office. Now, the petitioners are concerned that the Minister is not taking ownership of the issue. Their submission states that it is unfair to try and palm off decision-making to others and that the government will need to make funding available to enable this policy to happen. Uh, do colleagues have any suggestions for action? Mr Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if the committee would consider writing to the Minister for Higher and for Education to ask what consideration the Scottish Government has given to the recommendations of a practice learning funding report and what actions will be taken to implement its findings, and also if the Scottish Government will meet with the petitioner to discuss the findings of a practice learning funding report. Are colleagues content? We are. Now, I'm very conscious, Mr. Rowley has joined us this morning and his petition is here to consider us a little bit further down the agenda but you know I'm just going to pull it forward now to facilitate his participation in our proceedings because uh, he, he arrived early and didn't quite understand our evidence was a bit behind schedule so I'll move to petition number 2061 which is to require solicitors to ensure capacity of vulnerable individuals by having a medical professional co-sign legal documents. Uh, this petition uh, has been lodged by Laura Johnston Brand. Uh, 
And the petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to help prevent coercion of vulnerable, frail and debilitated individuals by requiring solicitors to have a medical professional co-sign legal documents confirming the capacity of the individual. And as I said a moment ago, we've been joined uh, by our colleague uh, Alex Rowley. Welcome to you. We last considered this petition at our meeting in January the 24th, when we then agreed to write to the Law Society of Scotland, the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland, the British Medical Association and the General Medical Council. And responses have been received from all these organisations and are detailed, as colleagues will have seen, in our papers for today's meeting. Now, while expressing sympathy for the petitioner, the Law Society tell us that they do not consider that it is necessary or desirable to replicate the golden rule approach in Scotland in light of other safeguards that exist. The Society also expressed concern that any requirement for medical professionals to co-sign legal documents could add significant complexity, delays and costs to the legal process. The General Medical Council noted doctors must work within the limits of their competence and should not be expected to make assessments about the capacity of the patients to make financial decisions if they felt unable to do so. And the British Medical Association highlighted that there is already provision for doctors to comment on capacity where appropriate and expressed concern that the petition's proposal risks creating an impossible increase in workload. In its response, the Mental Welfare Commission advocates a proportionate response and an expectation that solicitors exercise their professional judgment and has suggested additional organisations we may wish to hear from, including the Office of the Public Guardian. Now, we've received two submissions from the petitioner, sharing her reflections of the responses we've received. This includes expressing concern about processes designed to protect clients, such as access to the Client Protection Fund, and restating the view that this petition aims to build on the good practice that already exists to ensure vulnerable people are protected uh, further from exploitation. And before the committee consider how it might proceed, I wonder, Mr Rowley, if you'd like to contribute to our deliberations. Thank you very much, Convener, and I'm grateful to the committee for giving me this brief time this afternoon. I'm here to speak on behalf of my constituents because I believe they raise an issue that requires further examination. One of the fundamental points I feel being raised by the, this petition is the fact that an injustice has happened and as such we should look at what action is needed to stop that from happening again. As I understand the Scottish Government position, they believe that the rules detailed by the Law Society of Scotland alongside the additional safeguards currently in place are sufficient in protecting the capacity of vulnerable individuals when signing legal documents, yet we have seen multiple instances of this not being sufficient. Whilst the decision on whether or not a client has capacity remains one for the solicitor to satisfy themselves of the answer to, it is easy to see how a bad faith actor could manipulate yeah. this situation. The question of the golden rule, which is best practice in England, has also been raised which means that the capacity of someone who is elderly or suffering from or has recently suffered from a serious illness should be assessed by a medical practitioner where that person is seeking to make or change their will. It raises the question of why this can be considered best practice in England but not needed in Scotland. It could appear that we have less safeguards for vulnerable people in this situation than the safeguards in place in England. I don't come here today with all the answers, and I appreciate that this is not a straightforward, but it appears to me that some form of action does need to be taken to address the issues that are being raised here by this petition. I would appreciate if the committee would consider to investigate this matter further by writing to the appropriate organisations to establish the levels of complaints that have been made and the levels of concern that exist in Scotland around this issue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Rowley. Um, at the very least, I think we should uh, consider taking forward the suggestion of the Mental Welfare Commission of uh, writing to the Office of the Public Guardian. Um, and I would also suggest that uh, we speak to the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges and Faculties in Scotland um, to discuss these issues, uh, because I'm slightly disappointed by the kind of 
dismissive response that we've received from uh, other organisations who seem to find the proposal inconvenient. Um, are there any uh, other suggestions for action? Mr Torrance? I wonder, uh, Convener, if the committee would consider writing to a Law Society of Scotland seeking information on the number of applications made to a client protection fund in each of the past five years and outcomes of these applications. I also wonder if the committee would consider writing to the Scottish Legal Complaints Commission seeking information on the number of complaints that has received in each of one of the past five years related to concerns about a client's capacity or coercive behaviour by solicitors and how many times these complaints have been upheld. So a little bit of factual response. I think I'm seeing a suggestion of that, but we're, unfortunately we're not allowed to able to take contributions to gather. Yeah, yeah, uh, no. Uh, I, I'm, and I'm assuming you might, are you the petitioner? No. no. Petitioner is here, but so I, I didn't realise you were the gallery. So welcome to the gallery, but no, I, I should say we, we can't do that. Mr. Rowley, is there anything further you would like us to add in our, uh, by way of action? Convener, I think the proposals coming from Mr. Torrance uh, would help move this f forward. As I say, I don't believe that it is straightforward, but I think the more information we have, then the more we can look at is there a way forward. So, yeah. yes, I would very much welcome the proposals. Well, I think the committee are certainly persuaded that there are issues um, to hand in all of this, and I'm not quite satisfied that just being told that everything is as it should be by all the organisations that uh, currently um, operate matters is, is sufficient satisfactory um, guidance to, or, or comfort to the committee. Are the committee content to keep the petition open and to pursue the uh, the avenues of inquiry that we have. Thank you very much. We will do so. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Uh, we move then to petition number 2039, which is fair pay to student nurses while on placement. Um, our next, uh, this has been lodged by Amy Lee, and it calls on the, uh, urges the Scottish part, uh, Government to pay student nurses for their placement hours. We last considered this petition at our meeting on the 20th of December 23, where we agreed to write to the Nursing and Midwifery Council, the Royal College of Nursing and the National Union of Students. The Royal College of Nursing's response emphasises the importance of student nurses having supernumerary status, as this means that they must not be counted as part of the workforce required to provide patient care. The submission states that for this reason, RCN Scotland does not support uh, students being paid while on clinical placement. In a 2022 RCN member survey, 46% of respondents said that on their last shift, nursing students were being counted as staff in terms of the numbers required to provide patient care. And the submission states that while RCN Scotland does not support student nurses being paid while on clinical placement, it is clear that the Scottish Government must ensure that nursing students have appropriate financial support to allow them to prioritise their education, cope with the rising cost of living and compete, complete their studies without falling into financial hardship. Now, it, in its report on national student finance, uh, it found that 66 per, in, uh, sorry, in its report on nursing student finance uh, found that 66 per cent of respondents had considered dropping out of their course due to financial concerns and recommended that the Scottish Government implement a cost of living increase to the bursary and associated allowances and establish a regular review to make sure it rises in line with the cost of living. Do colleagues have any suggestions for action? Mr Torrance. Thank you once again, Convener. I wonder if a committee would consider writing to the Scottish Government highlighting the Royal College of Nursing's report on nursing students' finance and to ask what consideration it has given to the report's recommendations. We contend. We are. Our last uh, op continuing petition this morning uh, is petition number 2053 to stop the cuts to community link workers and help secure their long-term future within GP practice teams. Lodged by Peter Coston on behalf of Scottish GPs at the Deep End, calling on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to take action to ensure that the number and hours of current community link workers serving the poorest communities are not cut in the next financial year and take binding steps to secure long-term funding for community link workers in GP practice across Scotland. Last considered on the 24th of January, we have received responses from the Scottish Government, Glasgow Health and Social Care Partnership, Health and Social Care Scotland, Alliance, GMB Scotland, GPs working with community link workers, and from our MSP colleague Paul Sweeney. The responses, which are detailed in our papers for today, highlight the valuable role community link workers play. I think many MSPs receive submissions in this regard. I would, however, draw members' attention to the submission from the Health and Social Care Alliance, which comments that the dispute which prompted this petition centres not on the value of community link workers, 
workers, but over who should fund them, the Scottish Government or local health and social care partnerships. A number of submissions indicated a preference for uh, CLW funding to be included within baseline budgets from the Scottish Government to ensure greater certainty of funding for these roles. The Scottish Government have told us that a new National Community Link Worker Advisory Group has been set up and will, to quote, formulate detailed proposals for changes in relation to specific features of GP CLW services which are to be reviewed. Uh, do members have any comments or suggestions for action? Mr Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I wonder if a committee would consider writing to the Scottish Government seeking an update on the work of the National Community Link Workers Advisory Group, specifically what consideration has been given to introducing baseline funding that would provide secure long term funding for community link workers' roles. Are colleagues content to proceed on that basis? We are. Then we move to agenda item three, which is consideration of new petitions. And as I always do, to those who might be tuning in to hear how their petition is going to be resolved that we take advice from the Scottish Parliament's independent research body, SPICE, on the issues raised in the petition. And we also uh, invite the Scottish Government to offer a preliminary view. And we do this because, historically, those were the first two actions we would subsequently take. And this just lets us expedite discussion of the petition. The first of those is Petition 2110, Protect Wild Rast Stocks, lodged by Charles Miller. And it calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to develop and introduce a statutory fisheries management plan focused on protecting wild rice stocks in Scottish waters, beginning with a data collection exercise and introduction of precautionary fishery management measures ahead of the next fishing season, commencing in May 2025. The petitioner tells us that rice are used as a cleaner fish to tackle lice in aquaculture facilities and that their unusual reproductive patterns make them vulnerable to overcatching. The SPICE briefing notes that there is currently no total allowable catch applied to commercial RAS fishing, meaning there is no limit to the number of RAS above a certain size limit, which can be fished during the fishing season, running between the 1st of May and the 30th of November in each year. In its response to the petition, the Scottish Government highlight the mandatory management measures introduced in 2021. These require Scottish vessels to successfully apply for an annual licence on an annual basis for a letter of derogation from Scottish ministers in order to fish for RAS. The response also refers to the UK Joint Fisheries Statement, which contains a statutory commitment for the production of 43 fisheries management plans, with the Scottish Government indicating it is unable to confirm or commit to the production of additional fisheries management plans beyond those currently in development. We have also received a submission from the petitioner expressing concern that the mandatory measures are insufficient to ensure the sustainability of RAS fishery. The submission also highlights the development of a RAS fisheries management plan for England. Ahead of today's meeting, we have received an update from the Cabinet Secretary for Rural Affairs, Land Reform and Islands, indicating that the Government will be undertaking appropriate assessments of RAS fishing interactions with special areas of conservation and marine protected areas ahead of the next fishing season, opening in May 2025. The Cabinet Secretary's update has prompted a late submission from the petitioner, which has been circulated to members and raises concerns that the Scottish Government received the report mentioned in the Cabinet Secretary's submission in 2020, but have failed to act on it until now. Members will also have noted that the Rural Affairs and Islands Committee are exploring issues related to RAS fishing as part of its consideration of amendments to the Joint Fisheries Statement and its follow-up inquiry on the salmon farming industry. So the Government are actually going to, uh, however belatedly, do something in respect of the monitoring of all of this. So I wonder, colleagues, whether we feel that uh, leads us in a particular direction. Mr Torrance. Thank you, Convener. I'm actually going to surprise you. I want to keep the petition open. Um, <laughs> just so I could get information from the Scottish Government and what consideration is given to a total allowable catch limits on commercial RAS fishing and what discussions it has had with the UK Government on the development of its RAS complex fisheries management plan, specifically what consideration has been given to develop similar measures in Scottish waters. Well, uh, in an unexpected further burst of interventionist <laughs> uh, action, Mr Torrance has come forward with some proposals uh, where we keep the petition open and we actually try and tra track this down a little bit more in terms of detail. Uh, are colleagues content? Yep. We are. Then we will keep the petition open and pursue it on that basis. Uh, petition number 2111 is the Fund Early Learning and Childcare from Nine Months, lodged by Julie Fraser. 
This calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to provide families with financial support for early learning and childcare when their children reach nine months of age. The SPICE briefing notes that funding uh, ELC is available to all three and four-year-olds and some two- and five-year-olds. Eligibility for children under three is not currently universal, but is based on parents' carers being in receipt of certain benefits or the child or patient parent carer having experience of care. The briefing also notes that the programme for government in 23-24 said that the expansion of childcare support would cover children from nine months old. The government said it would work with local government and other partners to develop the local infrastructure and the services needed to provide childcare from nine months to the end of primary school in specific communities in six local authority areas. The Scottish Government's response to the petition states that it is working on the initial stages of an expanded national offer for more families with two-year-olds, focusing first on those who will benefit most. The submission explains that expansion work is currently focused on insights and engagement, including piloting new approaches through the Whole Family Wellbeing Fund and learning from the six early adopter, adopter communities. Uh, do colleagues have any suggestions for action? <coughs> Mr Torrance? I wonder if a committee would consider writing to the Scottish Government to ask how engagement pilots and investment in the early adopter communities will benefit children at nine months old in these communities and how this work will inform its development of a target offer for one and two year olds. So we're interested in keeping the petition open and Mr Torrance has made proposals. Our colleagues content to accept. We are? Then we do. Uh, petition number 2112, uh, also in relation to childcare costs, is a, a petition to conduct an independent review of childcare costs and availability in Scotland. And this has been lodged by Carol Erskine on behalf of uh, pregnant then Screwed. The petition calls on the Scottish Parliament to urge the Scottish Government to commission an independent review of publicly funded early learning and childcare in Scotland in order to better understand and address the challenges families face when trying to secure uh, and uh, secure and afford childcare. Now, the background to the petition provides details of the petitioner's survey looking at childcare in Scotland, in which 83.7% of parents said their childcare costs are the same or more than their income, uh, with 70% of mothers and 50% of fathers responding to say it doesn't make financial sense for them to work. The SPICE briefing notes that while data from Coram Family and Childcare Services Surveys shows childcare costs in Scotland are rising. They remain lower than average prices reported for England and Wales. In its response to the petition, which is similar to that received on the previous petition we just discussed, the Scottish Government states it is investing nearly a billion pounds in high quality early learning and childcare in 24 25. The response goes on to highlight the funding follows the child approach to deliver to the delivery of the 1140 hours uh, ELC offer which allows parents and carers to access their child's entitlement from any setting in the public, private or third sector who meets the national standard, has a place available and is willing to enter into a contract with their local authority. The Scottish Government also refers to independent research, which suggests 97% of parents with three to five year olds were satisfied they could access funding ALC in a way that meets their needs and notes that an evaluation into the 1140 hours entitlement is due uh, to report in 2025. Now, we've also received two submissions from the petitioner, the first of which comments to the Scottish Government response and draws our attention to a review of the early years sector in England commissioned by the UK Labour Party before it entered government and calling for a similar review to take place for Scotland. The second submission highlights the mostly negative experience of the childcare system that parents have encountered which notes issues around availability, council boundary changes and the inflexibility of the current system to meet family needs. Submissions have also been received from the University of the West of Scotland, drawing our attention to the research that is undertaken on the challenges faced by mothers working in the performance arts and entertainment industry. And again from our MSP colleague Tim Eagle in support of the petition's aim. So in the light of the... Uh, information that we've received from the Scottish Government and from SPICE. Do colleagues have any suggestions on how we might proceed? Mr Torrance. Uh, thank you, Convener. I wonder if the committee would like to write to National Day Nurseries Association Scotland, the Scottish Private Nursery Association, 
the parents group Connect and COSLA seeking the views on the issues raised by a petition. And I wonder if the committee would also write to the Cabinet Secretary for Education and Schools, highlighting the submissions the committee has received and the call raised in petition 2011 for funded childcare for children from nine months, and also seeking an update on the work to develop new childcare offers, including details of any discussion the Scottish Government has had with the UK Government on the issue, specifically the financial support available to families. Our colleagues contend they are. And that concludes our consideration of new petitions. Our next meeting will be on the 13th of November. And we now move into private session to consider agenda items four and five.